Cautionary Tale A 30 gram mushroom trip report by Psychonaut Psychon Posted to Eerwood.org December 11th, 2006 To the reader Psychedelics have had a major influence on my life In exceptionally positive and negative ways Overall though, I would say it's positive However, I feel it is of utmost importance to communicate that psychotropics are not toys They should not be abused and should never be underestimated the following is an account of the worst night of my life. I don't mean to turn anyone off of psychedelics. I still take them, even after that night. But I just mean to say that you should be careful, wise, and be prepared. I'd had significant experience of mushrooms before this mental excursion. If you are a relatively new user, do not even consider a dose of this magnitude whatsoever. Circumstances After an unpleasant trip on about a quarter, and I had a little over an ounce of mushrooms left, and I was determined to achieve my head-breaking trip no matter what. Unfortunately, I was experiencing serious second-guessing. I was even very near to the point of just throwing it all out and pretending it never happened. My continued sanity would be well worth a few hundred wasted dollars. I did not, however, heed the call of my intuition. At home, alone, depressed and frightened on a Monday night, with school the next day, I ate every last bit of that ounce. After a couple of minutes, the taste alone made me gag with almost every mouthful. My body did not want to consume this, but I forced it to anyway. The trip. My first impressions were almost immediate. They were not direct effects, but rather perceived and self-perpetuated effects instead. Namely, extreme paranoia and an intense feeling of wrongdoing. My stomach was starting to hurt. I was getting the overwhelming impression that I had killed myself. The effects at this point hadn't even set in. It now became a race. I decided that I had to get to bed and fall asleep before it set in. If I was asleep, my foolish logic told me that it could not hurt me. My stomach was protesting earnestly. I tried to vomit. I ran my finger to the back of my throat to no avail. It was down and it was staying. By now, I was panicking, trying to think of anything that might help me. I took papier enzymes, a digestive aid, but they did nothing. I took some Tums and some apple cider vinegar, both had been known to make me puke within minutes, but nothing. My stomach was hurting like mad, and the effects were now starting to kick in. I don't know how long it had been since I ate them. I would fought the effects, I tried to deny them. I tried to tell myself the shrooms were duds, or that this wouldn't be all that intense. I tried to tell myself I could handle it, whatever happened. In reality though, I was growing absolutely certain that I had severely fucked up. I made some tea, a last ditch attempt. I ran into my mother, and I'm not even sure if the sentence I constructed made any sense whatsoever. I said I had a sore stomach and I was going to bed. She sympathised in a motherly way and let me be. It was a half-saving grace. I was in my room now, afraid to leave, afraid to stay, afraid to fall asleep, and afraid not to. I lay in bed and waiting, lights out, desperately afraid. The trip came over me in a wash of colour and motion. These were the most intense visuals I have ever experienced, and some of the most disturbing. The best words I can use to describe it a kaleidoscoping gore. Colours and geometric forms and grimacing fleshy masses. Faces, maggots. They spun wildly through each other, tearing and melding skin, muscle tissue. My ears buzzed. My stomach ached. My head was being crushed, stomped on, torn to pieces, eaten and digested. I was being consumed. It was like some sick, bitter revenge. Everything was reeling. I forced my eyes open, and my room was a tableau of death. My lamp was a body hanging from the ceiling, grinning, melting, decaying. Everything around me was dead and laughing. I did not know where I was, or what was happening at all. All I knew was that I had done it to myself. I would killed myself. I was going to die now. I fumbled around and managed to turn my lights on. This fended off the visions to a certain extent, 
but could not really fight them. They came in wave after wave. I lived lifetimes. I died horrifically. I tumbled through endless landscapes of abstract nothingness and exponentially increasing worlds of fear. I struggled to cling to some rational thought processes. I tried to think of a way out. If I called the hospital, what then? If I'd told my parents, what then? If I called a friend? I couldn't do anything. I could not move, I could not think. Everything was spinning wildly. I could not control it. I could not hold it back. And I could not rationalise it. Eventually, I cannot say how long this took, but the visual subsided somewhat. I lay curled in a fetal position with the lights on, my stomach pulsing with agony, my mind buzzing and twirling, fleeting glimpses of nothing and everything. Pain. I could not escape the pain. There was no way out. I had to do something. But I couldn't do anything. I lay there for I did not know how long, shifting occasionally, forcing my body to move. Certain now that if I didn't continue to fight it, it would kill me for certain. There would be no chance. Eventually, I managed to pull myself out of bed and drag myself to the washroom. It was late now and everyone else was asleep. Mushrooms make me urinate a lot. I'd be making a number of trips to the washroom that night. Dozens, probably. Or perhaps that's an exaggeration. The washroom was clean and static. Relatively so. It was almost like a safe haven of sorts. I tried to puke again, but to no avail. It would have been futile anyway. The alkaloid had been metabolised already. The rest was just waste matter. I watched my face in the mirror for a very long time, wondering what I had done, who this was, why I was suffering, what I had done to myself, whether I was even real anymore, and whether anything had ever been real in the first place. I staggered back to my room and opened the door. I had previously turned the lights off. I held the door frame to support me. Everything was swaying around. For an instant, it was my room. Then the digital clock's red numbers receded into the distance, and everything transformed into a neon carnival. Towering mushrooms glowed amidst inexplicable shapes, silhouetted in glowing neon colours. I fell to my knees and crawled to my bed. My face felt as though it was dissolving. I was slack-jawed and falling apart, every single piece of me. And the bed held no safety. It was a psychotic raft in a sea of psychotic impossibilities. I closed my eyes and desperately clung to the last bit of reality I knew. They shouldn't kill me. My emotions and senses told me I was dying, but I knew I shouldn't be, and I held on to that thought. The next several hours, I spent either pissing, curled in a ball on the bathroom floor, or floating through infinite space. I cannot begin to explain the feeling of constant bombardment. All of my senses were perpetually overloaded, non-stop, for hours on end. I could not stop it, and I didn't even try to anymore. I simply let it wash over me. I was caught in the middle of a powerful river, and was clinging desperately to a rock. The rock came in the form of a word. A word that was repeated over and over to me, or perhaps I was saying it to myself. The word was Starwipe. I don't think it meant anything, but I do think the repetition was vitally important. I was caught in this endlessly repeating cycle, and the only way to stay inside and not slip away into oblivion, and what I thought must surely be death, was through this very word, Starwipe. I kept it close. I tried to understand it. I tried to search for a way out, a way to break the cycle. Sometimes I thought I had, but I would simply slip into another one, and then it all became the same. There were instances of calm. I could see myself, my essence floating freely and calmly through outer space, past stars and galaxies. A feeling of home, similar to the intense grounding trip I had at Harriet's where I visited the Orion Nebula. It simply slipped back into the chaos again, though. 
a fleeting moment of simplicity and peace, then gone. And there was another such moment, and here I regained control. I was able to reassert myself in the real world, to reclaim my mind as my own. It happened while I was in the washroom. I believe I was curled on the floor, when suddenly I felt what can only be described as an awakening or a profound realization. Suddenly, everything was clear. Absolutely everything. Everything that had ever happened and ever would happen. The why, the how, the who, just everything. I stood and felt the energy of the universe spilling through me. I was invincible. I felt powerful enough to flip a car or race against a photon. I didn't have to eat or breathe or sleep. I could do or become whatever I wanted. The feeling lasted maybe five minutes, if that. And then, it was gone. Lost and forgotten completely, save for this abstract verbal communication of it. Words cannot explain it though. I may never feel it again. After this point, however, I had hit the turnaround. I did not return to bed. I sat in my armchair and left the lights on. I was slumped and barely able to move, but I was awake and I was in control again. I felt pride and a sense of victory. I had won. I had lived. My stomach still hurt though, a lot, and my mind was far from clear. But the worst was finally over. Without question, I had made it through to the other side. Every so often, I would struggle to lift my head and have a sip of cold tea. It was vaguely soothing. It kept liquid and some semblance of nutrition in me. The more I fed water through my system, the more I filtered it. After several hours of this, I decided I was ready for solid food. I went to the kitchen to make some oatmeal. I sat on the floor while the water boiled. My cat did not know the ordeal I had just gone through. It did not understand the hell. It expected to be fed the moment I stepped into the kitchen. I felt like shit. Oatmeal and juice in hand, I made my way back to my room and tried to eat. I stomached perhaps two or three spoonfuls before realising that I was not yet ready for food. I lay there. Slumped in my chair until around 6.30am, at which point I moved back to my bed. I did not care if I was late for school. I could not care less. I sat for maybe a half hour before my mum was above me, shaking me awake. The first thing I noticed when I opened my eyes and sat up was that the demons were gone. My head felt lighter, and I knew that everything was essentially back to normal. Almost eight solid hours of absolute hell vanished into memory. I wandered into the kitchen and read the comics. I cannot say if I really read them, but I did try. My parents didn't understand why I was so tired. As far as they knew, I had slept all night. I did not explain myself. My oatmeal, reheated, was perhaps even more unpalatable, so I decided not to eat it at all. I stumbled out of the house and into the cold morning air, and it was sort of refreshing, I guess. The aftermath. This trip yielded probably the most definite after effects yet. The immediate effects were physical, namely my stomach. The gut rot had taken an extreme toll on me. I was barely able to eat for most of the day, and my stomach was still uncomfortable with most foods for almost two weeks. As far as my mind itself is concerned, I was humbled, but also strengthened. I was unable to explain much of anything to anyone, but I knew that I had seen more than most humans could ever imagine. And I had survived it. There was a secretive pride in that. My outlook would be forever changed. I cannot indicate a single lesson that I may have learned but it is unquestionable in my mind that I gained the equivalence of a decade of life experience from that one night. Actually, I can say with fair certainty that I lived hundreds if not thousands of years worth of lifetimes in that very night. Only perhaps a decade stayed with me though, consciously. In terms of long-term effects, I can say without exaggeration 
that I was tweaked for about six to eight months after this trip. Textured surfaces would often move or pulsate when I was completely sober. I would get low dose mushroom highs no matter what drug I took or how much of it. And sometimes my perception shifted entirely into a bemushroom state without any catalyst whatsoever. My interpretations, vision and hearing were all occasionally flooded with non-existent stimuli. I'm still wary of psychedelics. I know the true power now. My head has been broken open. My brain rearranged. I have been eaten, digested, and reassembled by the universe. And I am forever changed. An ayahuasca journey, sent in by a subscriber. There are a lot of different places I could start about why I wanted to take ayahuasca, but the place I feel is more suitable is the fact that I didn't like where I was in my life. I didn't like myself. I had a severe depression that made me wish I had the courage to kill myself every day. I had a brain atrophy when I was born that affected 30% of my brain and was always told I had autism. The trouble was that once my brain recovered itself, I technically didn't have autism, and this years of struggle with my identity ensued. I'd been going to therapy for almost two decades, and I just felt that it wasn't right for me anymore. The trouble with going to therapy is that you learn to say what therapists want to hear, and don't want to improve yourself. In comes ayahuasca. I'd heard about this sacred medicine for years, but never had the opportunity until the summer of 2021. I made it out all the way to Peru to be with Shipibo shamans. I went through the diet for about a month prior, and had the intention of getting to know myself, what my purpose was, say goodbye to my grandmother, who I never said goodbye to, and how I could be righteous and bring justice. This report in particular is about the second and last time I took ayahuasca. My intention was how I could be righteous, how I could bring justice. I felt an extremely strong calling to repeat this intention over and over again until I was called by the shaman to drink. I had a feeling this was the last day of being who I had been for all my life, so I said goodbye and drank. I sat in the darkness for a while when I felt the body high come on. I felt a slithering and rumbling in the pit of my stomach that vibrated throughout my body. The nausea set in. I thought to myself, of course, out of everyone here, I'm going to be the first to vomit, to which I did. And as soon as I did, the noise of the jungle and everything around me went mute. All I could hear was the vomiting. I suddenly became very tired, and an entity with what looked like a baby mobile made of light came to me. He gently pushed my head up against the wall and floated the baby mobile made of light above me. It spiralled around me again and again, going all over my body and making it vibrate at high frequency. As soon as it was done, the entity told me to look up, and so I did. What I saw was a row of stars shooting out into infinity. I was awestruck by how infinite the space was. There was no difference between opening my eyes or closing them. Then a voice told me if I was ready. Ready for what? I replied. An entity from the row of stars stuck their arm deep into my soul and took out my anxiety. I released a deep, guttural inhale that scared the other participants around me. Different entities were taking things from my being. My negativity, my anxiety, my depression, my anger. All that wasn't serving me in life. This kept going on for what seemed like hours with me repeatedly making deep guttural inhales and exhales. It turned from the entities taking things from my body and soul, to me taking in the pain of the universe and the other participants around me. I was sucking in the pain and exhaling it through my breath. Ayahuasca told me that I was to be a healer, 
and that will heal those I come across in life. Then it got frightening. My ego got in the way and suddenly time evaporated. I was stuck in the overwhelming feeling forever and thought I'd done it. I've gone mad and I'm never returning this time. But just as I was about to go insane forever, a hand tapped on my back. I opened my eyes to find a space filled with green smoke and a beautiful kind stranger sitting in front of me with piercing blue eyes. His skin was as white as snow and he was holding an orb made of soft red light. Are you okay? He asked, knowing my name. I nodded back, and he nodded back at me, telling me to focus on my breath. So I went back into it, focusing on my breath and coming back to myself. But as soon as I did, Mother Ayahuasca told me I had to die. What about my family? I asked her. She said they'll be fine, but that right now, I needed to die. So, I let go of all my family. But I asked, what about my friends? And she said they'll be fine as well. But I needed to die. And so, I let go of all of my friends. And then, I thought of my girlfriend at the time. Again, she said she would be fine. But right now, I needed to die. So then, I let go of her. And finally, I had let go of everything that was me. I vomited everywhere. I spread the vomit all over myself and the bed that I was given. I threw the bucket away to signify that I couldn't cling on to anything at all. All my pain, my memories, my time, love, my likes, my dislikes, all of that disappeared. And I began to ascend to a space of sheer, unimaginable beauty and love. I was walking along the literal road of creation. It was made of stars, colours I had never seen before, and made of pure source energy. I was led to a space made of an infinity of pink lights. All who I knew were souls of people and beings that had passed on. I felt everyone who I knew had passed on. I danced with them and they celebrated that I arrived. I was the happiest I have ever been in my life. My fear of death completely vanished. Mother Ayahuasca came to get me. I didn't want to leave, but she told me I had work to do back in the physical world. As we made it back to my body, she told me a couple of things. One was that I'd become a healer. More specifically, that my medicine would be mushrooms, and that I would need to work with this sacred medicine. She gave me tons of messages for all my friends and families about who could take ayahuasca and who couldn't, and giving out other sacred medicines that could work better for them. When we almost reached my body, she called a spirit falcon to pluck something away from my brain, and it flew away with my idea of whether I was autistic or not. You were just you. You didn't have to think you're one thing or another, she gently told me. And then she gently brought my spirit back to my body, and I was finally back in this reality. She said she would always be a part of me now, and that I cannot take ayahuasca ever again. She said that it would be too much medicine for me to take, and that the next time she would see me was when I would finally release my physical form. I then finally came back to myself in this space. I felt a hand touch my left arm, and I looked over to see my grandmother who passed away years before. I cried and thanked her for seeing me. She told me I never needed to say goodbye to her at all. With all of that, since that day, I haven't had depression, suicidal thoughts, or anxiety. I'm getting married to my girlfriend, and I will never take ayahuasca ever again. As Mother Ayahuasca said, it would be too much medicine, and I certainly received all the healing I've ever needed.
Edibles gave me a nightmare trip. A story sent in by a subscriber. This takes place in what I believe to be the late summer of 2019. I can't say for certain though, because this was the time of my life where I was sleeping most of the day and smoking stupid quantities of pot. Basically anything I could do to cope with my clinical depression, suicidal thoughts and PTSD. As you might guess, waterboarding my brain in THC and being starved of dopamine and serotonin for so long results in some vague and blurry memories, but I do my best here to include as much detail as possible. With that disclaimer and context taken care of, let's jump into the story at hand. The entire situation begins when my dad and stepmom decide to leave town for a trip. I honestly can't remember what the purpose of the trip was. I guess it was to visit family or just go on vacation. But the only thing I was concerned with was the opportunity to blast my brain and avoid all semblance of real world responsibility. This was before weed was legalised in my state, so I made arrangements with my dealer to acquire as much bud as I could afford. My plan was to go full zooted Zaza zombie. I remember this being the only time in my life that I seriously considered stealing money, Also, I could afford more marijuana. I'm relieved when looking back on this situation that I never saw from my family, even though I had the opportunity to many times. Anyways, I cleared my wallet on several grams of my dealer's top shelf gelato that he got in from Colorado, just in time to start my binge the night my parents left town. By the time they had rolled out the driveway, I was already rolling and lighting a joint, and by the time the sun was beginning to set, it was time to move to the main phase of my plan. I crushed and spread the majority of my stash onto a baking tray to decarb in preparation for infusing some can of butter. I eyeballed the proportions and didn't really know what I was doing, so I really had no idea how strong it was going to be. As it turned out, it was extremely strong. This summer was unique, because it was a moth bloom year in my area. Moths literally covered the windows trying to get to the light, and the light beams from lamps outside illuminated countless moths buzzing and flapping into one another. I love insects, and especially moths, so this is a notable part of the experience. Moths and butterflies are symbolic of death, and therefore transformation. Moths are active at night, and I feel the darker side of the symbol of transformation. I'm not a very spiritual person, but part of me likes to think that the moths ushered in the bad trip to come as a reflection of my deepest fears and traumas. As the night went on, I remember taking pictures of my face and being highly critical of my appearance. Some real vain vampire shit. The dogs watched my strange behaviour over the night with an expression like, the fuck? While my can of butter was infusing, I just kept smoking weed to get as high as I possibly could. At some point, I remember going into the backyard and walking back and forth listening to my music, completely creating a really cool video game in my head. I crafted the world, music, gameplay, look and characters for the game completely in my head, I remember feeling sad that I would never make this game in real life because I lacked the discipline to do so. I eventually finished and strained the can of butter and turned into sleep while watching YouTube. The next morning is when the trip really begins. I woke up still high, but that was good to me. I fed and pet the dogs and lit up another joint to greet the day as stoned as possible. Today was the day I was going to saturate my brain in as much jar as possible. I made myself toast and tea. I spread several generous tablespoons of my nightmare can of butter onto some toast with jam and added some more to a cup of tea. I went out back to sit and look at the yard as I ate. Fucking disgusting. The flavour was absolutely putrid and packed with weed turpines and it took me a while to choke it all down, but in my mind at the time, it was completely worth it. But I was completely wrong. Eventually I finally cleared my plate and my fate was sealed. I was already high, so the come up snuck on me somewhat, but I fairly quickly realised that things really looked distinct and beautiful. I seemed to consider objects in their entirety, and even the most mundane sights looked so beautiful. I remember plucking a sleeping moth off of the stucco wall, and delighting in its shape and form. I fixated on the tiny feathers that created grey patterns on its wings, until it buzzed out of my hand. Most people who have been very stoned can probably relate to what I'm saying about how amazing things can look. I just walked around my house and appreciated the beauty of everyday objects and scenes. 
Eventually, I noticed a static at the edge of my vision as I continued to get higher and higher. The things in the corner of my eyes looked blurred and colourful, like pressing your palms to your closed eyes. My mind was so elsewhere that I could no longer appreciate the visual beauty around me. Things began to seem dull and far off. I did not even comprehend most of what I was looking at. I was feeling so high that staying upright felt difficult. I just felt so tired. So I decided to lie down and watch YouTube on my laptop. I spent an unknown amount of time just browsing YouTube. But eventually, I arrived at the topic of astro and particle physics. And considering particle behaviour in the Big Bang was absolutely crazy to my zooted mind. It was mad how I clearly was able to visualise properties like particle spin and probability clouds. I eventually came into a psychedelic state while watching videos of space. I realised that I was the universe observing itself. That the matter, energy and entropy that makes up and drives outer space, galaxies, other people, other life and myself, is all in fact the same stuff. I felt emotion at how much of an insane miracle and coincidence it is that I could live and think and see the universe, and therefore, myself. I realised that I was part of a beautiful and unbelievably big process, and that my identity, struggles and joys were all tiny specks in the grand scheme of things. I was just a tiny piece of the universe, given the gift of consciousness and perception. What a beautiful thing. What an honour. What a miracle. This was the highlight of what I realise now to be basically a full-on trip. After this realisation and sense of peace, the trip quickly spiralled downward into darkness. I essentially lost all sense of vision. Although, I am aware that I could see my surroundings. I was not connected to the inputs coming into my eyes, and was only able to really witness the images my mind generated. I started to think about how worthless I was to squander this miracle of life. I was a unique process given the privilege of thought, free choice, and the ability to influence the world, despite being composed of matter and processes that could not themselves be conscious or change the world. How foolish of me to spend my time getting high and feeling sorry for myself. Fucking worthless. I felt so critical of myself for not making an impact in the world, for not making things, for not researching and discovering and for not forming emotional connections. I just felt so small and worthless. The absurd situation that is the universe conspired through coincidence to create the process and identity of me, and all I could do was feel depressed. These thoughts became more abstract and less based on words. I lost all concept of my surroundings and of myself as an ego or distinguished identity. I experienced a new world and identity composed of my own imagination and the absurd amount of THC flooding my brain. I was reduced to a low consciousness soul. I was a white orb, almost sperm shaped. I was in a dark, dull tube. I was fighting furiously to reach the end. I saw the end of the tunnel as it came out to a flared lip shape. I knew that I absolutely needed to reach the end the other side. Life was on the other side. I reached the space beyond, but I couldn't quite escape. I slid backward in despair. I fought so hard to stop sliding, but I couldn't. I eventually slid out the other end of the tunnel in free fall. There was another tunnel just underneath the first tunnel waiting to catch me. I fell back through the second tunnel just like the first one. I was in horrified agony. I fought so hard trying to make progress to get up to the second tunnel, but I just couldn't. I fell backwards again, and discovered tunnel after tunnel, each beneath the previous one. I realised that I had failed. I was a soul trying to achieve actualization and birth, but I couldn't make the cut. I fell and slid backwards for a small eternity. I eventually hit the bottom, and fell into a small area. My surroundings were doldrums grey. I felt compressed and I panicked. I thrashed and I tried to escape, but I was imprisoned. No matter how I thrashed, moved or tried to free myself, I was held fast in a colourless membrane, in a colourless box. I was so uncomfortable. 
I was squashed and suffocated and felt unbearably claustrophobic. This membrane would just not let me free of my confined area at all. My perspective then zoomed out, and I realised that I was one of many trapped and failed souls. We were all confined in these membranes in a square matrix that went on for eternity. I couldn't escape, because I would just bump up against more confines. These confines is all there was. Then they were cubes and the matrix of imprisoned souls stretched for eternity, in all three dimensions, and then extra dimensions that I could not comprehend. I cannot truly convey the feeling of claustrophobia, of being trapped and suffocated in an infinite spiritual prison. There was no escape, because there was nothing else for me anymore. I was condemned. Eventually, I started to come down. I came back to my body and my identity, but I was very shaken. I was still high, but I decided to throw out the rest of the can of butter, realising that I had gone too far with it, and I felt that the can of butter itself was evil. I spent the next few hours trying to return to a normal brain space. I showered and took my dogs for a walk, which made me feel better. I eventually just went to sleep and woke up feeling still strange the next day. After the next few days had passed, I started to feel normal again. I've since experimented with LSD and mushrooms, but I've never experienced a psychedelic experience just like this experience I had. I have since improved my life after that long bout of depression. I live with my boyfriend now, and I'm pursuing education and a degree. I wrote this up to make peace of the experience. I now explain the trip as the manifestation of my depression and the pandemic to come. The soul trying to be born but feeling thwarted mirrored my struggle to reach adult actualization. Falling backwards into that prison was my own prison of my depression, and how I became stuck for so long in my depression, which is represented by the claustrophobic feeling as well as the depressing grey colour. The matrix of other souls could be thought of as all the other young adults out there feeling thwarted by depression in a late stage capitalist society without meaning. If you're going through depression right now, I promise it will get better. There'll be ups and downs, and life might not be exactly what you want or expect, but depression is an illusion that can only fade with time. Just don't underestimate the psychedelic properties of THC, and especially edibles, unless you really do want to be immobilised in bed for several hours, experiencing firsthand the pain and terror of a soul failing to come into existence and condemned to eternal imprisonment. Motherly love, puppy love, ecstatic sex, then absolute stillness and the universe laughed. A 200 milligrams of ketamine and 150 milligrams of modafinil trip report sent in by a subscriber. I'm a late 40s health professional in small town Midwest USA who bumbled into the world of psychedelics by listening to Joe Rogan and Aubrey Marcus podcasts. My wife and I had both struggled with depression related to childhood trauma and we were getting nowhere with traditional medication. We found an underground guide for MDMA-assisted therapy, and were blown away by the immediate insights and peaceful acceptance that the medicine brought us. Soon after, we learnt about the healing effects of ketamine. I've had several experiences of both medicines taken at six-week intervals utilising the inner journey format, relaxed with earplugs and eye mask. For me, this facilitates amazing clarity of mind, and allows me to learn the most from the experience. I am exceedingly careful not to overuse, and I commit to at least two integration sessions with my trusted therapist between journeys. I'm hoping that psychedelic medicine becomes accessible to the greater population, because it is our human birthright to connect with these higher states of consciousness and wisdom. I had a day off, and the kids were at school. I took 150 milligrams of modafinil at 7am, an hour before plugging 200 milligrams of ketamine to potentiate my awareness and recall. My ketamine experience usually only lasts three to four hours, so my intention was to get an early start and have a productive afternoon. 
This was a moderately high dose for me, so the experience hit pretty hard within about 20 minutes. I would consider this experience to be what is called a K-hole, when you are immobilised, slumped in your chair unable to interact with the outside world. It is a very pleasurable experience. I lost any feeling of my peripheral body, arms and legs. The best way to describe the feeling is, as if your heart centre is all of you, and all of your sensations are coming through your heart versus your extremities, eyes and ears. You see and hear and feel, but do so in another realm. Or maybe, your physical body is bypassed, and you are experiencing the environment through your spirit body, aka soul, astral body, energy body, etc. But who knows? For me, ketamine visuals are very tactile and textured, like different kinds of blankets of different colours and fabrics. There is a living energy to the visuals that seem to be vibrating kindness and love. There is also a presence, perhaps my own guides or a wise entity. I like the Kerman experience, because I am able to directly dialogue with this wise entity. The modafinil helps with this, it makes my mind become razor sharp and clear while navigating the K-hole realm. It also allows me to remember my entire experience, which helps with integration and journaling. Ketamine is known for helping with trauma, depression and PTSD, and I can understand why. It's as if your body's limbic system or brainstem gets turned off and rebooted. These are the places in the brain that hold charges of extreme emotions associated with past traumas. It is the place of hypervigilance and triggering. When experiencing ketamine in this way, you realise what it is like to be at peace in your body, completely relaxed. Areas deep in your body that you did not even know were holding tension, even your organs, just let go. There is a stillness that is sublime. There is a certain hue of fun and humour. I began asking the wisdom within the realm to experience certain things. I thought, I want to experience divine motherly love. And in an instant, I was being cuddled, cooed and hugged by thousands of doting and beautiful mothers. It was like being tuned into the bodies of thousands of little babies being hugged and kissed by adoring and smiling mothers. Little baby eyes locked in wonder, with mother's loving eyes times a thousand. I then thought, I want to experience puppy love. This is the kind of crush a young boy might experience towards his kind teacher or teenage babysitter. Still quite innocent, but there is a fascination with the female energy. Smile, bosom, laughter, sweet smells, etc. It is a pre-sexual attraction, but attraction nonetheless. So with this thought, I was blasted into the energetic field at a stadium concert between Taylor Swift and thousands of adoring fans. I realised that she represents an idealised youthful form to millions of adolescent and young women. This form is playful, fun and expressive, unashamed and classically feminine. And Taylor Swift is also teasingly erotic in a naive way, without the dark overtones of exploitation that cloud much of adult sexuality. It is beyond describing how absolutely fun it was to feel all this youthful and innocent feminine energy synergizing in the energetic field. I was swimming in it. I was it. Then my adult male brain kicked in, and I thought, I want to experience incredible sex. The best way to describe where I went next was a fabric of numerous intermingling male and female genitalia. Imagine having hundreds of simultaneous male and female orgasms, then resetting and having a hundred more. The pleasure was very balanced, as if feeling the subtle differences of both genders. It was also balanced with the heart chakra. So it wasn't the mistaken ideal of sex with Fabio or a Playboy model. I asked for incredible, so that naturally includes the subtleties of both gendered climaxes, along with a deep heart connection. You would think I'd want to stay in this experience forever, but the next thought I had was that this is enough. I want to experience stillness. It is hard to believe, but what I experienced next was infinitely better than a hundred simultaneous male-female orgasms. I met a guide, a mature woman yogi, meditating in full lotus. She asked me to face her and join her in meditation. 
You've released all your desire. Now feel what it is like to know stillness at the core of your being, she said. I was now in a desert-like area that was both simple and beautiful. I felt grounded into its dusty earth. I felt timeless. I felt safe. I had no negative feelings about myself or the universe. There was nothing here that I wanted to change. There was nothing I wanted to become. With her meditating across from me, I felt a deep loving connection. I was both alone in silence and deeply connected to this other being. I could have stayed here forever. I tried to hold on, but another being formed in front of me. A fat, bearded Indian man, laughing heartily. I represent the universe. I am a smirk, not a smile. Do you know the difference? He said. So much information was downloaded all at once. Yes. A smile signifies one pole of duality. Its genuine form is a beautiful expression of pleasure and happiness. A smile energizes both the one who is smiling and the others that witness it. The universe as such is not one polarity, therefore not aptly described wholly as a smile. A smirk is knowing that things are not as they seem, there is something else going on. A smirk says, I challenge you to figure out what's really going on, or what I am thinking. A smirk also says, Don't take yourself so seriously. There is a joke, and it may be on you. The Indian man then said, Once you figure it out, we will all laugh about it. Then, I felt the entire universe laughing. Not a mean laugh, but a heartful belly laugh, when one is let in on a practical joke played by dear friends. I knew the experience was coming to an end, and I asked to bring the wisdom learnt to be integrated with my human everyday self. I had a short visual of computer plugs that represented my brain being rearranged, and I was left with this parting thought. Everything I do becomes a gift to myself and others when I don't have any desire. In this sense, desire means that which gratifies only the self, or that which diverts attention from the present moment, or that which wants to change circumstances. In relation to earthly desires, like lust, wealth, fame, etc., I understood that I could appreciate the things desired without needing to consume or strive for them. After a few days of integration and journaling, it dawned on me that medicine showed me three developmental levels of yearning for love, first as an infant, then as a boy, then as an adult. This striving and reaching out for the comfort of love came from a place of emptiness, a feeling that I was fundamentally unloved. It was that misunderstanding that I needed to get love in one or more of its elusive forms. After all my desires for love were quelled, I was shown the gift of stillness. What it feels like to be whole just as you are, at peace in your own skin or soul. From this place of stillness, I became powerful. I realized how much creative life force I could wield from the place of stillness versus a place of desire. Wait, am I that which I desire? The universe is laughing a hearty belly laugh, and I'm now laughing with it. I had just tried 2CT2 for the first time a couple of weeks before, and I'd had a mixed bag of experience, due to either taking too much of it, or dosing too closely together. So last Wednesday, I figured my tolerance had dropped enough for a leisurely good time at least, and I wasn't looking for a full-blown gourding anyway. Early on in the evening, I'd started popping robogels for a chest cold I've had for over a week now. I'm never one to take the prescribed dose of anything, so I'll just take a handful of them and lay down. I'd eaten earlier, and was relaxing on the couch watching the tube when I decided to take a little bit of the last two of my T2 stash, around 25mg. 
I just dabbed my pinky into the bottle and administered it rectally. I figured the come up would be quick and there wouldn't be any tummy issues like I'd experienced on earlier experiments. It took about 45 minutes to come on. At this point it was basically just a body high. It was okay, but basically a yawn. So I decided to take another dab and wash it down with some water. The come up from the additional dose was much quicker and was seamlessly integrated into the experience as a whole. So I'm watching something on the TV, can't remember exactly what, and I was tripping decent at a plus two level or so. There's only some mild visuals, with no pronounced patterns or images. With eyes open, the room looked sharp, as if the contrast had been tweaked on a TV set or something like that. I took the rest of my robo gels for a total of 20 pills, around 300 milligrams. The combined dissociative effect with the psychedelic effect was interesting. I wait about an hour and just say fuck it, and down the last of the powder in my medicine bottle, because I figure it wouldn't be rewarding to take such a small dose on its own anyway. The full effects hit at about three hours, and the combo with the DXM created a unique mind space, neither one or the other as far as dissociative versus psychedelic. I lay down and drift off for a while, not really thinking or focusing on anything, just being, floating maybe. But then it completely shifts in its nature. I'm now no longer tripping. I remember no visual distortions at this point. My mind drew silent. There was no thought, yet I was able to form thoughts if I wanted to. I felt extremely lucid, relaxed, at ease. There was no disturbance inside or out. It reminded me of how I would get after prolonged sitting meditation. Clarity and insight into the mind that was effortless. It was a sense of gentle, silent benevolence sweeping through my being. I just breathed slowly, and sat up to look around the room. It was dark but clear. I could see the moon outside shining its soft silver light. All there was, was silence, stillness. I was exploding with joy, on the verge of tears even. Just the memory of it, and I'm starting to well up now. I was no one empty. There was only joy and love remaining. I smiled gently to myself and just basked in the breath. The air felt like, well, I don't know. There was no inside or outside. It was just this. I waved my hand around and laughed at the symmetry of the gentle trailers coming off of it. Again, there was no real patterning or imagery at all. I felt an overwhelming impulse to pray, something I never really do nowadays. I said something to the effect of, I want to share this with every living being. I want them to know this peace and joy right now. All of the countless living creatures. May we all awaken and share this together. I ask no one in particular for forgiveness. May all of my misdeeds be purified. May my intentions be true. May all of the harm and wrongdoing I have done be undone. May it be rectified. May I harm no one ever again. My voice dropped to a low and even pitch that sounded at peace and without any ego, at least it seemed so. There was an echo after my words, like a digital delay or some sort of reverb. It was like a perfect mystical experience as someone would picture it. There was just perfection in every word, in every breath, in every gesture. I asked myself in an amused way, who is the master? Where is Joshu now? Where is the Buddha? Where is the true self now? And the answer flashed instantly and silently. We are. All of us. This one. We are alone. Forever alone. But together. We are all we have. Forever and ever. Well, at this I just lost it. And wept with despair and joy and love and release all at the same time. Just to be alive. Amazing. How could we ever become so lost? How could there ever be any confusion as to our place and role in existence? And most of all, how could there be any separation and hatred toward our brothers and sisters, ourselves? I wept and wept at my ignorance and wrongdoing. I just wanted the mercy of the infinite to embrace me and give me peace. I was ready to die. I would give my life for yours. I 
would give my life for yours. The meaning and reality of love struck me so deeply that it would be offensive to even try and describe the utter simplicity of it. The beauty in everything that is asleep, just waiting to awaken. How could I ever deserve this gift? I could never, not in a million lifetimes, be worthy in myself to receive this kind of love and acceptance. As I write this, my heart is pounding and my chest is shaking. My cheeks are wet with unwiped tears. All I can say is that I feel grateful. Gratitude. That is all. There is no answer other than this. No higher truth to be known. It is a matter of continued disciplined practice to actualize this experience in all of my actions. And that may never be completely accomplished. But we have nothing but time. My weekend was a tad more interesting than most. Here goes it. I'd been in the throes of planning the psychedelic vision quest from fate for well over a month. Ideally, it would be a marriage of an eighth of mushrooms and five hits of blotter, each of both myself and my girlfriend, who, for the sake of anonymity, I'll refer to simply as C. Taking into account the significance of set and setting, C and I had been preparing ourselves mentally for the voyage for weeks and we'd resolved to go camping somewhere near the beautiful Florence area of the Oregon coast. Fate, as it seems, finds pleasure in throwing unexpected curveballs. There'd been massive busts by police two weeks prior, and the Bart Simpson supply had temporarily run dry. Every hookup window was stumped. Thankfully, we at least had the quarter ounce of cubes. Thank God for agriculturally minded hippie folk. Undaunted by the fascism of law enforcement, C and I continued with our original plans. The only difference was a stop on the way out of town to take advantage of sale prices and Robitussin. Dextromethorphan would be our shuttle to the Tryptamine Airport. Destination, Consciousness City. Wasting no time, C and I chugged two bottles each of the bitter red syrup in the parking lot, washing it down with Oddwaller grapefruit juice. Time management here was essential. We'd left town much later than expected, and worried about the availability of campsites on a Saturday. The drive would provide ample time for the subjective effects of the DXM to manifest, preparing the proverbial launch pad for our trip into psilocybin hyperspace. None of the effects were felt until C and I arrived at our destination. The break in my concentration on the hazards of the road allowed my awareness to focus on the strong DXM-induced mind-body dualism. Parking the car next to the host campsite, I looked in the rearview mirror. My pupils had obscured all trace of colour in my eyes, save a tiny circle of green. I was fucked up. The flanging effect of the DXM was quite pronounced. My vision no longer retained continuity of motion, as I noticed my perception was broken into frames. The black frames in my visual sensorium were occurring with an almost mathematical cadence, about one black frame of visual perception for every four regular frames. My body was an awkward, analgesic mess. Robo-walk undoubtedly followed shortly, so I quickly exited the car to tend to the necessary business of paying for our overnight camp. Sometime later, after smoking several bowls of C, we decided it was time to shroom. We evenly divided the quarter into halves, and proceeded to chew on the earthy stems and caps, after smoking two more bowls and waiting about 30 minutes, we were determined to go for a walk. We made it to the mouth of the sand dune trail, when we realised our consciousness was extremely altered. I sat down next to C, who was obviously having great difficulty in integrating the intense experience. My entire body felt alive with a gentle humming sensation, and the visual distortions of the mushrooms were beginning to reveal themselves. What I would experience next would render me speechless. As C and I sat on the top of a sand dune, I noticed pieces of reality beginning to fragment and shift wildly. Pieces of my visual perception would seem to break off and move about randomly, only to return mysteriously into place. All objects were cloaked in a rainbow aura, and I detected an internal dialogue of two voices conversing in gibberish. 
The flanging effect of the DXM was also still present, and the black spots in my visual field were filled with detailed hallucinations. Of the visions I remember, one stood out in haunting significance. I perceived an infinitum of mutilated, disembodied heads floating in a black void. Usually my visions are of such an abstract nature that they bear no resemblance to reality, but this vision disturbed me with its lifelike detail. I looked down at the sun beneath me, and witnessed the likenesses of people forming and dissipating to the rhythm of the distant tide. My attention, however, was quickly drawn to another couple, walking hand in hand down the dune trail to the nearby beach. With no regard for the splendour of nature, they discarded an empty pack of cigarettes in a tuft of nearby reed grass. I looked at the pack, and then looked towards the sun. Sol was the unwavering constant in this newfound world of flux, and I felt the intensity of his warmth tenfold. This cannot continue, echoed a booming voice through my skull. I realised quickly what the voice meant. Such wanton destruction of the environment could not continue. Careless litterbugs are significant of a greater societal malaise, people's general obliviousness to the complexity and fragility of our natural world. The vision of the disembodied heads was a sinister omen. We are all doomed. I thank God, or whatever the hell that voice was, for imparting his wisdom. The trip immediately began to mellow out, and I enjoyed the usual mushroom trippiness magnified by eight ounces of cough syrup. The rainbow auras surrounding objects began to morph into bluish-purple fields of energy surrounding every object I looked at. These were actually discoloured tracer images of whatever object I happened to be looking at at the time. The only really uncomfortable feeling that was noticeable was a great confusion that seemed to come in waves. It was as if the mushrooms and the DXM weren't synergising completely, and were fighting for control of my subjective experience. Truly weird, but somewhat enjoyable. When I got back to the campsite, C and I decided that nitrous was in order. We cracked the tiny canisters, filling each of our balloons with laughing gas. I inhaled the gas deeply, feeling control of body as well as sensations slip away from me. The last memory I have is seeing a rush of colour. I woke up some time later, C had passed out next to me, still grilling nuts. I can't remember what the hell happened, and the first part of the trip are the only lucid memories that I have. That something fucked up just happened feeling that one often feels after coming down off a trip is still lingering, and it's now Wednesday. This is probably the closest thing to religious revelation that I've ever felt, and I've learnt not to alter my consciousness like that for a while. Such are the things schizophrenia is made of. To the Gansfield. A Mind Machine, Nutmeg, Salvia Divinorum at 10x Extract, LSD, and Nitrous Oxide Trip Report, posted by T. Brown to Earwid.org, July 8th, 2008. About three weeks ago, this was edited again six weeks after the event, I set aside a weekend night to be devoted to some experimentation with a combination of LSD, Nutmeg, Nitrous, and my newly arrived Salvia Divinorum 10x Extract. I was eagerly waiting to break into this. I didn't originally intend to use the Gansfield sensory deprivation setup that I had previously assembled for use of DXM, although it ended up playing perhaps the most important role in the course of my night. However, it was the nitrous and salvia that were the most important to my main mission of the night, which was to be an attempt at total ego annihilation and body disassociation. This was to be obtained through a loosening of my hold on the world with nutmeg and LSD and then brought on fully through an intake of both salvia extract and nitrous oxide in quick succession. I'd previously experienced ego loss in varying degrees on a variety of substances, and body disassociation as well, most often with DXM, but I'd yet to ever find myself in a fully dissociative state, completely unaware of the existence of my body, or in a state of ego loss so profound that my fundamental concept of the I 
was ever truly obliterated the way I'd read about in many experiences with smoke DMT and salvia. The nutmeg I had decided on, due to being unable to procure any decent cannabis, and because the low quality cannabis that was available was extremely overpriced. Since nutmeg has always given me a high very similar to low quality marijuana, I decided it would be a decent substitute for my purposes. I took three heaping spoonfuls of nutmeg at around 6pm. Within an hour, I began to notice some increased visual snow, phosphine-like apparitions in my field of vision, but little else really. At about 9pm after coming back from the gym, I took my tab of acid and took a shower, getting giddy as I eagerly awaited the come-on of the LSD and nutmeg effects. I spent the next few hours coming up into a very pleasant if mellow trip. I listened to music, jammed on the guitar for a bit, did some charcoal sketches and drew a big psychedelic mural on a cardboard board that I had lying around with markers. Around 1am, I decided it was time for the main course of the night which was to come in the form of about a tenth of a gram of 10x salvia extract, followed immediately by a hit of nitrous oxide from one of the whipped cream cans I had ready in my refrigerator. As we began to get everything set up for my big trip, I started to feel a good deal of anxiety build up. My brain recoiled in fear of the ride it was about to go on. I put some low-key music on, Bob Marley I think, and dimmed the lights, in an attempt to get myself properly relaxed before I took the plunge. I took the salvia via vaporizer, heating it to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. I laid myself out on some couch cushions on my floor with the vape next to me. I unwrapped a can of whipped cream, waited a minute or two, and took deep breaths to relax myself, to get ready before the plunge. I affixed the vaporizer tube to the vape and took four large hits, which I held for a count of 30 seconds each. With each inhalation I felt myself, my perceiving being, pushed farther and farther from things I'd always closely associated with concepts of self and began losing consciousness of, and sense of control of, my physical body. I was being pushed away from my memories and personality, my ego if you will. Although that being said, I would say I still possessed a strong sense of a self, although a much degraded self. At this same moment, a sort of special gravity seemed to kick in. This is an experience common to all my strong salvia trips. I felt the strong pull of gravity on the back of my head, and more so deeply within my being, dragging my consciousness backwards into my skull with a sensation not unlike that from the plunge of a roller coaster drop, although without any of the adrenaline or deep stomach panic feelings. Realising I was quickly losing control of my functions, I hit the off button on the vape, whose coloured lights were already strobing considerably, and I lifted the whipped cream can to my mouth. The nitrous hit took immediate prominence in my attention over the rising salvia effects. I felt like my head was a balloon being poured full of helium and rising on its string, floating to the top of the room. The sound in the room coming from my speakers began to climb in pitch and became totally unrecognisable as music, although not at all unpleasant. The music, which now manifested itself to me as a pleasant and intricate buzzing, sounded as though somebody had hooked up a wire pedal to the input cord of my brain and was rocking it back and forth in steady rhythm. My vision at this point, while I still recognised the room and objects within it fairly well, became very chaotic, with these very strong green, red, yellow and blue coloured spiderweb patterns overlaying everything. The room also began to have a very pronounced spin, much like that produced by heavy alcohol intoxication, although I experienced none of the nausea common with alcohol. Body disassociation was almost complete, and while at this point, my name and much personal information had long since checked out of being, a definite sense of self as a being still remained. I could feel the nitrous effect subside as the salvia continued to build. The fuzzy-headed upward floating was again replaced by the salvia special gravity sinking. Knowledge of my body had returned completely, although ability or want to use it was non-existent. As the salvia effects continued to build up, the open-eyed patterns became more intense, taking on more filled-in geometric schemes. The erratic and nondescript spiderweb patterns took on a more Mandel-esque shape-based form, reminding me both of pre-Columbian Central American art and Eastern Hindu and Buddhist art, although the general impression was much more of the former. Faces began to appear in the pattern, 
not clear faces per se, because the pattern was still very much merely an overlay of material objects in the room, but the perception of faces began to manifest itself within the pattern. The overhead light at the centre of my room took chief hold of my attention. It seemed to be a being in itself, or more so a half-being, for I recognised it well as a simple light, but also as an entity. At the time, however, this duality did not seem at all odd or contradictory to me. Although the light did not speak to me in any clear sense, I got the distinct impression from it that I would need to try harder in the future to get what I was looking for. Staring at the light, it seemed to take on an arachnid character, with thick black leg lines growing from it and twisting around it with the spin of the room. Despite the visuals persisting in intensity, I began to feel more and more the presence and importance of my body, and the many scattered facets of my ego began to fall soundly back into place. Most importantly, the idea that this was all the effect of a drug became concrete once more, pulling me out of the aimless trance state I had been in. I realised that my goal of total ego and mind-body dissolution had not come to fruition, however I was very excited. There was, as the spider light had suggested, more I could do. The idea of the sensory deprivation Gansfeld fell immediately into my mind. I was almost overwhelmed with excitement to begin, but for the moment, I was still far too intoxicated to start setting it up. So instead, I laid back for a while, closing my eyes and enjoying the intricate patterns forming on the backs of my eyelids. The salvia effects had subsided for the most part soon after, though given my already altered LSD and nutmeg-induced state, I would say my trip had been kicked into overdrive by the recent experience, both as respects a far more noticeable high and fogging of the mind, as well as much more prominent visuals and patterning. Setting up the Gansfeld, especially with all its parts scattered around my apartment, was to say the least, difficult in my current state, and took a good hour and a half. This would make it approximately 2.30am now, six and a half hours after I first took the LSD, about five hours since I began to feel its effects. I had a television covered in a blanket, creating white noise for my headphones, two lamps with low watt red bulbs in them set them over my head, and the ping pong balls of adhesive already affixed to them ready to put on over my eyes. The only downside of my setup is that the TV had a 15 to 20 minute auto shut off timer when it was playing static. I actually kind of like this though, because I figured it would keep me from being there all night and into the morning when my roommate might come home early and find me obviously in some sort of weird drug fueled ritual. One thing I feel I should make clear about my personal experience of the Gansfeld is that unlike float tanks that induce darkness like effects, it causes one to simply cease to process visual stimuli. For me, this has represented itself as a loss of all sense of visualisation, making it quite a bit different from darkness, in which I found visual hallucinations actually increased. In this way, it is for me more of a true deprivation than what comes from sensory deprivation tanks. Meanwhile with white noise, I find the sense of sound remains very prominent, unlike with noise cancelling, making sound take of a greater role in Gansfeld experiences than in sensory deprivation tank ones. And likewise, vision becomes of much less, if any, importance. Figuring out how to hit the vape and the whipped cream without being able to see was quite the challenge. I loaded the vape with the salvia from last time, figuring it might have some active chemical left in it that had not been vaporised, and added another eighth of a gram of extract, intent on really blasting off this time. Being effectively blind did little to ease my anxiety about the coming trip, but I was so eager to really break through that I was able to spur myself on, despite images of Frankenstein-type disaster floating through my mind. Vape tube in one hand, whipped cream in the other, I took in and held several hits of the salvia. I don't recall exactly the number, but I would put it between 5 and 8. I experienced the same rising cloud of confusion and removal of aspects of self as last time, along with the special gravity beginning to move me back into my skull. This time though the effects, due to taking more hits with more salvia in the vape and the Gansfeld, built up quite quickly. I felt I was barely able to get off the nitrous hit while still able to function. I inhaled and leaned back into the floor. With no build-up, within an instant, it was all of it. Everything. Like nothing I'd ever experienced before. 
I was falling back into my imploding skull, falling backwards, back, 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 and into falling. And it is all eternal nothingness, and I am all gone. All but my tongue and my teeth. They are my everything. Tap the teeth with the tongue. What is that? What is? Then, the tongue and teeth disappear, and there is no body at all, just a wisp of eye, cartwheeling in the engulfing nothingness. Then, nothing. Gravity in the back of my head. Gravity sucking in everything. A black hole in my skull. Spinning. Consuming everything. My vision and hearing shut down entirely, and I lost all sense of my body. Though, I did have the distinct feeling of being something, through powerful sensations of rushing backwards that I felt. The white noise faded into a cascade of unchanging sensory waterfall that became a sonic pulsing of my entire being. For an indeterminate amount of time, I simply was not. Then out of it, I became aware that I was, and had begun quite recently to be. As I continued to be, I felt myself expand out of nothing. I began to grow. This feeling was akin to a sense of birth, and then growing up and maturing in life. I felt a strange sense of removed pride in my expansion, not unlike that which comes from beating a level of a video game that hasn't fully captured my interest. This continued for a while, and I continued to grow, expanding into the nothingness. After a time, my parents appeared to me in a blurred conceptual form. They were thoroughly chastising me for being so amazingly high, so altered. Although my sense of sight had shut down, I saw them, as if in a dream, as large hulking cartoon bears, towering over my expanding but still small child entity. I tried to get away from the chastisement, picking up on their suggestion that I was just high, and tried to look around me, hoping to re-establish contact with reality, only to be met with a featureless field of dull red infinite. I fell back into nothingness. A whirling phantasm, and I am, I am, I am, I, 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 I. No I, an I simply, an I was all that was left of me. Pure perception, zero introspection. Internal monologue, which had ceased to exist, began again but was degraded into single word concepts repeated again and again, as my flailing ego sought vainly to lay hold on some semblance of recognisable thought, some foothold of cognition to reassert itself on. Just as one experiences the tip of the tongue phenomenon, able to recognise a concept or thing, but not the words for it, so was I able to vaguely guess a word and concept, but unable to lay firm hold to either. The words, experiences both as concept assertions and audible stimuli, were repeated again and again to me, quickly degrading in understandability and meaning, with repetition and trailing off into infinity, before blending into the omni-echoing static and being replaced. I then fell into a very distinct and detailed memory of being about six years old, and playing with my next door neighbour and best friend in my neighbour's basement. I was going up their stairs to go outside into the fresh summer air, totally caught up in the game of imagination we were playing. Then suddenly, I fell out of the vivid memory and was bodiless again. Then another one of my oldest friends, Mike, came to me in bodiless concept form and tried to put me at ease as to what was going on, telling me to relax. Next, my friend Dave appeared to me laughing hysterically and asking me why I was so fucked up. I could not rightly give him an answer, but began to find my current state very funny as well. I came to with the static of the TV chiming off. In a heavy fog of confusion, I lifted the ping pong balls off my eyes, turned the TV back on, hit the vape again, replaced the eye covers, and fell back into total ego loss. Whether there was any active chemical left in the salvia that had been left in a vaporizer at 400 degrees for 15 minutes or so, I do not know, but lying back into the Gans field was enough to blast me off yet again. The phenomena of coming vaguely back taking a vape rip and falling back into nothingness again happened a few times. I felt like I was coming up for much needed oxygen each time, and then diving back into the deep enveloping sea 
of unsurpassed beauty and wonder that was total disassociation. On the last time I dove back into the Gansfeld, I began to feel terrified as my ego drifted away once again. I thought it would never be me again, that I was doing something incredibly dangerous, that I was dying even. I had no anxiety up to this point, but now, adrenaline, deep stomach terror, it shot through my body as I opened my eyes wide and saw nothingness. I tore off the ping pong balls, gasping for air as I sat up. I quickly relaxed at seeing the world appear again, and realised I had nothing to worry about. I replaced the eye coverings, and drifted off once again. When the TV kicked off again, I made the decision that it was time to come back to myself. It was a slow and difficult process. I felt amazingly drained and tired. I'd spent almost 30 to 40 minutes in a state of total ego and body disassociation. I felt like an infant. I'd move my head up, look around the room, and then drop it and close my eyes, trying to gather the gravity of what had just happened and reassert myself into the world. All my concepts of the world as it was, all my hard-earned objective philosophy, all my Nietzsche and Heidegger, all my things in and of themselves, all my memories and concepts of self, all of them were blown to total shit. I sat in complete wonderment of the fact that I had a body, of the idea of bodies and being themselves. That simple thought brought me to such exquisite joy. I sat in pure rapture at being again, while at the same time basking in the ecstasy that had been non-being. It was as if both were infinitely enjoyable, and I was now on to enjoy the treats of being after a good time, a measureless time, of ecstatic non-being. When I had the energy to stand, I wavily walked around a bit as I gathered my thoughts. I got naked and began to admire my body, and the wonder of having a body in the first place. My thoughts were at this point still highly frazzled, and everything in the dim red light seemed to be breathing heavily. I laid back down for a time, simply basking in what had just happened. And I came back in a body that knows how to play guitar. This was a wonderful fucking revelation. I grabbed my electric lickety fucking split, not caring to plug it in, and began to play away to my great joy. My fingers flashed around the fretboard, great trails of bright blue streaming off of them, and into the dim red surroundings of each note that I plucked. After a bit, I walked upstairs to my room, purposely avoiding the mirror. I wanted to wait a bit to look at myself for the first time, and sat down with my acoustic on my bed, and tried to reflect on just what the fuck had happened. It seemed amazing to be so absolutely separated from all things human. The utter difference of my experience from all else I had known had completely blew my mind. At this point I began to get extremely excited about my prospects in life. I truly felt my previous self had died, and though I grieved him, the new me had been born through his death, and he had to live. And live he would. How easy everything would be. No tiredness would ever hold me back, no anxiety. Everything was possible. I could go out and meet all sorts of new people daily, bring them joy and love. I could work on my guitar playing, on my art, on making those closest to me happy with threefold efforts. I could practice meditation more as I'd always meant to. I could start keeping a good dream journal again and work on my lucid dreaming. And yes, I could at some point in the future use substances as tools to lose myself in the ecstasy of non-being once again. A shaman born. A shaman born was I, one who could choose to not be. To be, or not to be, was no longer the question, no longer a question at all. It had become a choice. Existentialism is everything, and as Sartre said, existentialism is humanism, but I could become unhuman. I had overcome existentialism, overcome existence even. Ubermensch. Ubermensch? I almost could not wait to begin running around meeting and helping and loving people, even if it was 4am at this point. Looking in the mirror for the first time occupied a good half hour, as I admired my physique and got happy about being placed into such an adequate body. I decided to take a shower, which felt amazing. Towards the end, I switched the water to as cold as it would go and stood under it as long as possible before jumping out. 
At this point, I may have creeped out my neighbours through our thin walls by yelling, I'm alive! Woo! I'm alive! And whooping around the apartment. However, it wasn't all sunshine in the hours following the experience. There were birthing pains to be had. The next hour, as I was still tripping to a large degree, unfolded into a series of questions. Who am I? Am I me? Who was me? Nah, I'm not him. Have I killed him? I had to stop myself from thinking a few times. I pull an e-break on my thoughts, because I felt myself going right off the deep end into a total freak out. I began to realise the risk of running such a heavy trip without a trip sitter. At the same time, I think a trip sitter could have negatively affected the experience at many points, especially me coming out of the Gansfeld, where in my weakened and confused state, I would have been very embarrassed to have a person watching me. I'm not sure what good a trip sitter might have done at this crisis point anyhow. I probably would have rambled to them, apologising for killing the friend, which might have driven me further over. Whereas being alone, I was able to decide, fuck it, whatever, with all of the I don't give a fuck. Years of minimum wage jobs and pointless American high school had taught me so well. I have Mondays off and this had been a Sunday night. At around nine, as the first wave of people were taking the bus down to class, I decided to go out with them and get myself a nice fruit drink. It's not that I didn't have drinks in my refrigerator, but I felt the need to mingle with my fellow humans, to start right away meeting and sharing love with the whole human race. Dostoevsky was right. Understanding is forgiveness, and I understood and forgave all that was human. This turned out to be an absolutely terrible fucking idea, I'd expected everyone to be as bright-eyed and enthusiastic about life as me, and I was met with bleary-eyed, tired, and pissed-off-looking people on all sides. The noise was incredibly loud to me, and I felt awkward for my own breathing as I sat silently on the bus. The bus's movement also made me extremely motion-sick, and I found myself getting off at an early stop to walk home, rather than risk my LSD-weakened stomach. I was being self-conscious for the first time all over again, and it truly sucked. The way home from the bus stop, I got off by a cemetery, which I decided to walk through. My thoughts at this moment on death were odd. On the one hand, I loved life intensely and never wanted to die, and yet death, non-being, was infinitely better and more powerful than anything I had ever known. How were those souls beneath the ground faring? How was it not to be ever again? The morning was crisp and warm, and the sun on my face felt amazing. I was still getting slight visuals, and the morning sky dotted with lightly breathing clouds looked picture perfect. I walked further into the cemetery, paid respects in my mind to those who are once like me, yet now no longer were, were never to be, and walked out of sight of the road and into a copse of trees. There, I sat down, and I cried. I'll end the narrative there, although I had many similar if less intense experiences over the next few hours before going to sleep and to a degree the next day. I can say that this trip definitely has affected me in what seems to be a permanent way, although not to the extent I originally thought it would. It has made me change my views on perception-based reality and the ridiculousness of objectivity in any sense. I've abandoned to a degree. My faith in any amount of rationalism or empirical organisation to make things clear to me when perception can be so radically altered by something. This was a mystical experience in every sense of the word, and although it instilled in me no spiritual revelation in respects to organised religion or any set beliefs, it made me realise I was foolhardy in casting spirituality aside, and I now strive to embrace it and break down the protective walls I had built up around myself against spirituality that had masqueraded as philosophy. I realised my entire epistemological theory had been flawed. I'd been totally caught up in knowing, maybe sometimes realising, but I never felt truth. That night, I felt the truth of being as only non-being could make me truly feel it. A truly philosophical lesson. Over the next week, I made efforts to tell my parents and all those close to me how much I loved and appreciated them. I put myself forward in new social situations and attempted to help and love as best I could. My resolve in this faded disappointingly quick though. 
especially in regards to branching out socially. Fatigue, which I was sure I could cast off as regular part of life, continues to be a problem, and I find myself being too tired to put all my best efforts forth, in most things most of the time. And still, self-improvement is a long road, and I use this experience as a drawing point for motivation towards progress. The other lingering effect of the trip is that I still feel as though I'm not fully the same person I was when I left that night, although much less so than when I first came back to myself. It feels like a chapter of my life ended that night, and a new one has begun. It is much like how I feel the day after a heavy DXM trip, the difference being that with DXM, that sensation lasts a day or two, and this has lasted six weeks. I haven't used any psychedelic drugs since this, despite having friends trying to get me to trip with them on spring break. I feel I need to digest this last trip quite a bit before returning to anything of that sort and get me well rooted in me. I still feel a bit wispy ego-wise as well. Anyhow, not to be too long-winded, I hope you liked it. As a postscript, if this hasn't already become a bit long, I would like to comment on the philosophical implications of this experience as regards to my view of perception-based reality. I had before this taken perhaps a bit grudgingly that reality is perception-based and ultimately subjective. I was a postmodernist, but only because I couldn't find a way around postmodernism. I, however, drew the conclusion, erroneously, that somehow because a given perception schema I've come to hold is more persistent than others, that it is more consequently more important, and more importantly, more real. And this was a grievous mistake in valuation, perhaps brought on by my fears of succumbing to postmodernism and loss of valuation grounding. Nevertheless, this eye-opener has helped me cast this off. I don't see my experience then as fake. It wasn't just a total loss of body and self brought on only by drugs, and that really it was just me lying on the ground with ping pong balls in my eyes tripping my brains out. Rather, I see a duality of reals, in which non-existence, my total non-existence, stands out as more palpable. For a better example, I think of my first girlfriend. When I was with her, I thought myself thoroughly in love. Now I hardly see that as even possible. And yet how can I challenge the reality of previous perception based on what persists just due to its persistence? What evidence is there that the persistence of perception is equal to its reality? I have adopted a quite Hegelian idea of epistemology, seeing knowledge of being as a flower. It first must be a bud before it can bloom into greater things, and must be a flower before a fruit, but all a real knowledge of being that must be cultivated. Knowledge is improved by synthesis, and possesses inherent dualism between immediate and persisting perceptions. Hegel applies the idea of the flower bud to mankind as a whole, and I think this is very suiting. How we as a race viewed the world years past is totally different from our real, now with big bangs and atoms and such. It is much like my being in love before. Was I not really in love because this image has not persisted? Was spirituality, as Nietzsche thought, or mere escapism from the threat of death, just because the evidence from which spiritual conclusions were drawn have not persisted? Will not our current scientific mould of reality, and our current hypo-deductive epistemology not seem ridiculous to future humans? Will it be as much a myth as dead and denied love? Will we deny the Big Bang ever was if we find evidence somehow to the contrary? In the great chain of history, it is easier to side with the present, and give yes and no's to these questions. But given the essential duality found in perception, as it must apply to how we judge real, relying on persistence to understand reality is ultimately foolish. Fear Death. A Salvia Trip Report by Fat Tony. Posted to Earwid.org November 24th, 2012. This report is a summation of my Salvia experiences over the past four years. Let me start out by saying that it has been an unexpected journey of consciousness changing. At times my experiences have been familiar, 
and seem to echo the reports of many others, while at other times there is no reference to describe the experience, or for some reason, no such experience even manifested, despite a high dose. When I first heard of Salvia, I was intrigued by stories of how it knocked cocky, hardcore drug users on their asses and made them piss the pants. I also became aware of a certain respect that was needed to help guide one through this experience. I was quite nervous on my first attempt, seeing a friend go first and completely freak out, luckily while on the couch with five others to look after him. My hit actually got sucked through the bubbler prematurely, and I wasn't able to obtain a good hit at all. There were too many people waiting to go, so I opted out after my failed attempt. My next attempts were with chewing leaves that I bought online, and smoking these said leaves through a corncob pipe. I also smoked an extract bought online through a bong. Nothing extreme happened, and I was quite disappointed. There were nuances of my perspective changing though. I would hear music coming from the room above me, and the drums or beat would seem to take me into a trance, almost like falling into a dream. I would almost see a campfire with a drum circle around it, but as soon as I became aware of the visuals I would snap back into reality. On my next try, I smoked four hits of 5x in one minute in front of my buddy, convinced that this would be my breakthrough. This resulted in some uncontrollable laughter, and for some reason, I felt like an orc or Shrek. It's really hard to explain, and I've never experienced anything like this after that one time. I wasn't ready to give up though. The same thing happened to me when I first got into weed as a sophomore in high school. It took like five different times before I really got high, but when I did, oh boy, I was fucking gone. I took around eight rips off a bong and got up to start walking. I remember feeling a wave of energy run through my body, and it really affected my ability to walk, like as if I was in a riptide. The next thing I remember, I was waking up on the ground and people were running up to me to see if I was okay. I was on no other drugs, just weed. I felt really high, and actually blacked out twice after that within the next 30 minutes. So to sum this point up, once I could actually get high on weed, it was like I broke some barrier in my brain, and that shit could really fuck me up. Like once I hallucinated these bubbles running through my skin, in my veins and up my arms, around my face from the back of my head. It wasn't painful, just extremely bizarre and awkward. So with Salvia it was sort of the same thing. It took a lot of tries, but once I broke that barrier, it was like unlocking that part of my brain. Alright, so back to the interesting stuff. At first for me, Salvia was like getting into a trance. I had to sit down because after I smoked it, I could not move for the life of me. My body was like a block of cement and I would get crazy pixelated visuals. Nothing of significance though. To be honest, I wasn't really getting anything out of the experience and I enjoyed pot a hundred times more. Sometimes I'd try smoking salvia on top of a bowl of ganja, but this just seemed to make the weed high unpleasant. It wasn't until a couple more tries that I really broke through. After experimenting with salvia over the last couple of years, I've come to realise many interesting facts that most of my peers or those YouTube kids never bring to light. I know that different people have different experiences, it's just the way things are, our biological makeup and such, but I do often wonder if there is more at play here. These facts that I'm talking about have to do with guiding the experience, almost like preparation in meditating. I find it most important for inexperienced users to realise that you have to let go, give in, and say goodbye to your ego. I've seen too many people say that it did nothing, this stuff doesn't work and it's just a waste of time. That's exactly how I first experienced it, and now I know why I didn't break through those first few times. So upon smoking, I like to take some time to get a bowl prepared. I meditate for like 10 minutes. I focus on a goal, or just nothing at all, clearing my mind the best I can. No music either, I do it most of the time in the dark. I don't usually have a sitter, honestly I don't even need one because I get the most out of it when I'm lying down in silence, I mean I can't even move unless I really try anyways. So I smoke and hold it in, and I know it's coming right away. I start to become more aware of myself, my body, its limits and borders my mind and its current thought patterns, but something else usually happens on top of this. Honestly, I can't really explain in words because I can't exactly remember how it happens, but I know when I'm there it's a familiar feeling. 
I'm going somewhere else, or trying at least. I have to let go, let my body go numb, let my awareness transform. It feels good to let go anyway. Sometimes there's a pixelated wave of energy coming in from the left. Usually I start to sweat in really bizarre places, like certain parallel lines throughout my body or even from inside my ears or the spot in between my eyes, and this sweating is extreme. This usually starts out hot and becomes cold. I believe that this is part of the process of my conscious energy spirit, or soul, or whatever you want to call it, leaving my body. It's so weird because I never experience these specialised points of sweat any other time. So this is when I usually become aware of them. <laughs> yeah, I know it sounds crazy, but they are inhabitants of another realm. I can't even really see them in familiar terms. I see them as energy beings, but it's more like feeling them there and definitely hearing them. Usually they're saying, quick, come, what are you waiting for, come with us. There's a sense of urgency, but not out of fear. It's more like excitement, as if they want to take me somewhere fun. But very rarely have I actually gone though. If it happens, it's right away, and I'm transformed back into their world almost instantly. This is where I agree with people that say it feels like zippers. The best way to describe it is that it feels like the boundaries of my body. The skin on my arms, the side of face, and just everywhere feels like it's merging through a barrier and becoming the landscape of the other realm. Like my arm becomes a river, and I forget that it used to be my arm. A world emerges from inside me and flips me inside out, and somehow my awareness crosses over. And they are always there too. It's usually a different setting. A mountain resort, a carnival, a marketplace. It seems like a totally normal world when I'm there. Everything seems so happy too, so alive and energetic, but as soon as I'm there, it is fleeting. I'm slowly coming back. A lot of times I'm actually aware of this other realm and the current reality at the same time. That place is overlaid on this physical reality in my vision. I can perceive both and if I really focus, I can bring myself back to reality instantly while the salvia realm disappears. But that is not the point for me. I want to stay there as long as possible. Try to relax and let go as much as possible because I think it's my body that brings me back in the first place. I actually think this could be part of the dying experience. This is actually referenced in James Arthur's book, People Darkness. I know I wasn't influenced by this book because I read it two years after having these experiences. But it makes sense to me that consciousness exists in our energy, our spirit. And when our physical vessels die, we exist somewhere else. It feels very welcoming too. It's kind of like the movie What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams. And I also did not realise this movie connection until I saw it after many trips to the Salvia world. But the whole part where he's moving around in a painting is pretty close to the actual experience. I always feel like my true self too. Like various parts of my mind shut down and I'm existing as me. The same me that I was as a child, and the materialistic world just does not seem very important at all. These personas, these egos of ours really mean nothing. Some revelations I've had from Salvia is that our purpose for existing is to feel good. When we feel this uplifting and loving energy in life, on a soul level we are moving in the right direction in the physical. Like a way to measure our spiritual progress. Words cannot really explain these revelations though, as many know. Also, I've experienced the sensation that my perception of reality as a human is akin to looking out of two eye holes and using my head and body to move around and bring into view my reality. At the same time, I've been aware of another reality existing behind me. I was actually attached to it and poking out of that reality through my face to view this one. It sounds so weird, but it's like in that world, everything is connected. It's landscape and inhabitants. The physical body allows us to separate and poke out into 3D physicality. There is no separation in the spiritual realm, like how we perceive it here in this physical existence. I actually believe that there isn't separation here like we think there is, but our minds do a very good job of shaping and creating this 3D lucid dream we call life. So, one last interesting fact I would like to use to bring my story to a close, 
is that I've discovered that being under the influence of alcohol actually enhances and prolongs the experience. I've had a genuine trip for 1.5 hours, where beings entered my body and existed within me, like my stomach was a realm for them. They were talking to me, and I can distinctly remember three with different personalities. One was a very young girl, around eight years old. Another was an older, wise man. The third was an adolescent and playful boy. They were basically just hanging out, joking around and just swimming around inside of me. It felt kind of good, like they were keeping me company in a way. Other times on alcohol, I've experienced being out of my body and moving sideways through a wall. My overall awareness expanded outside the boundaries of the room. One time, I actually blacked out instantly, and I can vaguely remember seeing a tunnel of pure white light, and it felt extremely blissful. I barely remember it, but what I do remember was probably the best feeling I have ever experienced. True bliss and love. One of my last times experimenting with Salvia, I actually failed to go anywhere. The same onset sensations happened, the sweating, the awareness change, but it was in a weaker format. Instead of being aware of them, it was my thoughts that were intensified, telling me to let go. But it wasn't anyone else, it was a part of me. I was back to normal after five minutes of trying to leave. I know it has nothing to do with the dose either. Some of my more powerful experiences have been after some of the smallest doses. I'm excited to continue life and visit the Salvia world every now and then. It truly brings me back to my core where I know who I am and what I am all about. And I only need to go there every once in a while to remind myself of this and how small this reality is in the bigger scheme of things. And the last point I have to make, because of Salvia, I do not fear death. Microgram LSD trip sent in by a subscriber. I'm not an experienced psychedelic user by far. The first trip I had was on 600 micrograms of LSD the summer of last year at a party. Needless to say, it ended up bad, but I learnt a lot from it. I'd kept asking to see my girlfriend because I felt like she was the only one who could soothe me, the only one I really knew who I could trust. I also learnt to respect substances in general. I'd been building myself up to this experience for quite a bit. Ever since then, I've tried to only do psychedelics when I'm with my girlfriend. I've done shrooms here and there, and I've gotten over the taste, but LSD will always be my favourite. This is mainly because my last trip on shrooms was on 4 grams, and I felt a wave of evil enter my body. It was scary. So for this trip, I have to set the scene a bit. A couple days before April 1st, I had tripped on acid wasn't too fun because I was by myself. I was off 200 micrograms. On the night of April 1st, my girlfriend wanted to trip acid with me, and it had been a week for her, so according to the calculator I use, her recommended dose was 400 micrograms. My recommended dose was 600 micrograms, but I took 800 just to be safe. An hour passes by. Neither one of us is feeling anything whatsoever. I decided to smoke weed because I knew it would intensify the effects. I never thought it would have intensified it to this degree. At first, I had to lay down and pretend like I was sleeping. I knew something was up, and I was about to feel the full 800 micrograms that I took. As I closed my eyes, I could see the bedroom through this tunnel-like lens, something I swore I had seen in a dream before. As it was kicking in for me, it started to kick in for her as well. My mind is kind of hazy about all the events that occurred, so it may be out of order. But the first thing that I can remember is that we started talking to each other telepathically. I would look at her and think, I love this woman so much. And she would respond out loud with, I love you so much more. Eventually, after messing around with telepathy, we laid down and stared at the ceiling, just sorted through different emotions. I chose to be angry, and we both became angry. It wouldn't last for long, as a rush of joy would fill me, and all of a sudden, she felt that same happiness as well. 
Emotions came and went, in what I would describe as waves. I would feel sadness from one side of my brain until it reached hers, and that would become what we felt for about a minute before it was on to the next. At some point, I had started zoning out. I would fight back to make sure nothing insane would happen, but each time I zoned out, I would stay longer. Eventually, I decided to let go to see where it would take me. Vibrant colours would fill the room I would faintly see machine elves. I didn't see them vividly, but it was enough to make out what I was seeing. I'd started to feel like a machine elf myself. I'd realised how they play a part in keeping reality contained. They carry us from one moment to the next. If you see a picture, every line you see was another one of my senses. Everything I saw, like the walls for instance, that was me. Every breath me and my girlfriend took was me. Everything I felt through touch was me. Even the faintest smells were myself. I was connected to the reality that I was experiencing through this lifetime, totally. I started looking at my girlfriend's face, and she was shifting through different people, young and old. I saw my mum and grandma at one point. She said something to me and I had a flashback through my cousin's eyes. I know for a fact that he's done acid. Whatever she said to me, someone had said to him at some point. I can't remember exactly what it was though. When the flashback was over, I looked at my girlfriend, whose face was combined with many, many others. When I thought of a person, she became them. I tested it out with my mum and, just as I thought, she was her. That's when I realised she had the same soul as my mum. When I first took LSD, I looked at my mum and almost started crying, saying you were my girlfriend this whole time. Now that may seem a bit weird, but it's the fact that they shared the same soul. After this, I started to get scared. I told her, Keep shifting through realities. She replied with, And you will do so for eternity. Hearing that, despite not fully knowing what she meant, managed to calm me down. She then turned into a muscle, and this eye opened on her forehead and it started projecting what me and her would describe as creation. Excuse the vulgarity here, but she had gotten into the mood really badly. I won't go into detail, but I will just say that we felt connected in an unimaginable way. I was in control of my energy and everything I did. I knew what spots to hit, and I could feel her because I was her. I knew everything that needed to be done. Once she had finished, she asked me, Wait a second, how much did you take? That's when I had flashbacks of previous lives. She had been the officer who arrested me while asking me, How much did you take? She'd been next to me on my deathbed crying, How much did you take? She'd been my one friend who had been amazed, asking me, How much did you take? told her 800 and she was kind of pissed upon hearing this, but I assured her it was fine because of how well I handled myself compared to my first trip. I ate some chips afterwards and every atom within every chip was something I could feel. They were all different realities. We were trying to put on time by Pink Floyd to vibe out for the rest of the trip. Though, we got stuck in the same thought loop where we'd forget what we were doing, turn off the TV, only to be bored by the silence and then turn it back on broke the loop and finally started to wear off. After going through this experience, I am trying DMT next. Night When I Died from 5MEO, hosted by a similar competition to the 5MEO DMT subreddit over one year ago. I'll try to make my long story short. I've always been a seeker of the unanswerable questions concerning my existence. What is life? Why am I here? What happens to my thoughts after death? I struggle with suicidal thoughts, but at the same time, I'm afraid of dying and hurting my family. The thought that I end up in an even worse reality than the one I already experienced today also scares me. I cannot explain it other than that I am stuck in myself and that I am unhappy with my situation. 
After reading up on the subject of FiberMeO, I decided to acquire it via the dark web. This was the only way for me to get hold of this chemical. One could claim that I took a rough and careless gamble and kind of played Russian roulette by procuring the chemical from an unknown source. But that's where I was in life at the moment, and the only way for me to get hold of FiberMeO at all. I acquired all the necessary tools to achieve the perfect breakthrough after reading and searching on it online. Everything from the most advanced mod to a professional milligram scale, all to achieve the best possible result. I planned everything down to the smallest detail. Cleaned my apartment, took a shower, put on clean clothes in case something went wrong and someone would find me deceased. I'd even planned in exactly what time I would inhale the chemical. All this I would do by myself, without informing anyone about my plans. I loaded my vape with exactly 15 milligrams of MEO. I took three deep hits and kept them in my lungs for as long as possible. It didn't even take more than a few seconds before my vision cracked like plexiglass, and I fell within myself so deep into darkness and loneliness, and died. The feeling of dying was shocking to say the least. I had no previous memory of dying, but as soon as I died, I immediately recognised a feeling for some reason. It was such a shock and sadness to feel death, but I could do nothing but accept it. I can describe the feeling of dying in the way of that I fell backwards within my own consciousness so deep it is the most quiet and dark place I have ever experienced. It felt like I was rocked into the deep oceans, and my thought that I have just died was dissolved, and I really died and stopped existing. I do not know for how long I was dead or unconscious, but after a while, something extraordinary happened. The source of all intelligence revealed itself out of nothingness. It was the core of all knowledge. When this became known to the awakened conscious, the consciousness realised what it was immediately. Just like that feeling of knowing what it feels like to die, even though you have never died before. I do not even remember taking the chemical at this stage. I cannot explain the intelligence in words or pictures. I don't even know how this force showed its presence because I had no eyes or self-awareness to look at what I experienced. Call it telepathic, if you will. I was just nothing at that point. Conscious but not aware of myself or who I was, no matter how paradoxical it may sound. I was experiencing everything without knowing who I was, and that is the only way I can explain it. This force sat on all knowledge of all creation, time and space. I wanted to show so much information and energy at one time that it became frightening and far too overwhelming to even be able to understand or take in all the information at once. The feeling became so overwhelming and unpleasant that it gave the feeling of, let me go, that's enough now, just stop it. After that, everything dissolved into blackness again. Time didn't seem to exist during any one of these experiences. Afterwards, nothingness shifted into a reality and I started to get small awareness of what I can call myself again, but still not me, more like me in a dream. I am now in a crowded and mechanical space. The surroundings are perceived as metallic and old. I get a feeling that can be described as a rusty submarine or a spaceship. I don't know how, but for some reason, I perceive it as cohabiting with several different variants of myself. I experience it as a hologramic existence, where I as an observer am with different variants of me at the same time. I still can't remember taking the chemical at this stage. I can only take in what I feel and see as if I can only be aware, but at the same time have forgotten who I am. After a while, one of the variants asks if it will ever be okay again. Will everything be fine? And after a while, an answer is given that everyone gets at the same time. We will manage, and everything will be just fine. I then went on to experience the most euphoric happiness I have ever felt in my entire life. It becomes such a hysterical happiness that it becomes almost perverse. Such a hysterical joy that cannot be described in words whatsoever. It was like winning the lottery a thousand billion times over and over again. But after a while, everything disappears again. I'm starting to become conscious in this reality. The next thing I remember is how I feel my heart beating for the first time, as if I've forgotten how it feels to feel my heart beat inside of me. 
really feeling how it is pumping for the first time. Slowly but surely, I feel how blood begins to flow out from my heart into the veins. I feel how cold blood travels through all the passages. After a while, I realise that I have arms, that I have legs. I feel I now have a body and a stomach. I'm starting to feel a hard pressure all over my stomach as well. It is now that I wake up and realise what I have done, and that I am lying completely flat on my stomach with arms and legs completely extended to the floor like a flat frog. I've woken up and I'm slowly but surely beginning to realise what has just happened to me. When I looked at my phone to know what time it was, for some odd reason it had cracked during my trip in the middle of the screen. It was like if someone had shot it with a BB gun. And the weirdest thing is, is that there were no sharp or hard items around the bed area that could have done that damage. About 50 minutes had passed from the time I took the hits initially. I was gone for almost an hour. The experience never gave me a sense of time. It didn't exist until I woke back up again in this reality. Now, what did I learn from this experience exactly? I'm actually still learning from this trip and reflecting on it all. Sometimes I wonder what if I really did die in that old reality and woke up into this new one. An alternate version of the old one with the wisdom of knowing how it feels to die. It's just a thought, but still a disturbing one. The only thing I can do from now on is hope that it is true what was said, that everything will work out, everything will be fine. In order for me to know all the answers I'm looking for, I probably must die again. And I'm not ready to go through that again to research those answers, at least not today. I'm still afraid of dying, and the life I woke up to has in many ways become even darker than the one I had before the Fiverr Mio experience. But hey, it will be okay. Everything will be just fine. This won't be a long report, because it seems as if my mind has blocked out most of the experience. It was a Saturday night, a full moon and a supermoon, when the moon and the earth are closest together once every 18 years. Me and my girlfriend had been out drinking with her friends and had drank quite a lot. We eventually headed home around the 2am mark. When we did get home, we grabbed another bottle of wine from the fridge, sat out in the backyard and rolled a spliff and just sat around smoking and drinking. I'd recently received some changa from a friend, which he told me was particularly special, saying that there was something extra unique about this particular DMT and changa mix. I'd been hankering to try it for a bit, but the right opportunity hadn't come up. Normally I don't mix alcohol and psychedelics, but with the full moon and general good moods, I thought it was a good idea to give it a try. And wow, the first pipe, my partner and I had one together. She said she didn't have a very good experience. She prefers more ritualistic and natural settings for trips, as do I, but she doesn't take other settings as well as I do. It wasn't a breakthrough experience per se, but the fractal visuals were amazing and throughout everything. The main thing I remember from the first pipe though, was the sense of purpose. Here I'll digress a moment. I've been pondering on the nature of DMT in the world. What's it for and what's its purpose? I almost feel as if sometimes when smoking it, it takes over my entire thought processes in my mind, replacing the regular chemicals of DMT and its desires and purpose. I'd stood up and started walking, exploring the world around me. After it started wearing down, I wanted another pipe. I smoked again. Same thing with the visuals and vague purpose. I decided one more. It seems that third time is the charm. That third inhalation was the last thing I remember. The next part I can't describe very well, but I will try my best. I remember these intense visuals, barely being able to properly see, and God knows how long this went on for, but I believe the trip lasted a lot longer than usual, perhaps over half an hour. I tried to think, but I wasn't capable of any thought whatsoever. No thought of my own, anyway. 
I realized I had destroyed my mind. It was gone. Me was gone. Ego was gone. I felt as if I were in an infinite tessellation of colours, dimensions and things. All one pulsating, transforming, interdimensional something or other. The sense of dread I cannot explain. For it wasn't feared dread, just acceptance dread. I had left this world entirely. I would never return. It should have made me sad, but it didn't. I felt incredible. I didn't feel. I couldn't. There was no I to do so. I don't remember getting up from outside, but suddenly I was inside, in the middle of the most intense sex with my partner. We'd torn each other's clothes off, and she was half on the bed, half off, screaming in ecstasy. I felt one with her. I felt as if this was it. We'd be doing this forever. Which is not such a bad thing, I guess. Infinite sexual ecstasy and reproduction and transformation was what I felt. This went on for quite some time and for the entire come down from the DMT as well. I feel a majority of what happened in the experience was blocked out by my mind, with only inklings of what I experienced seeping through to me. It was heaven and hell. It was infinity. It was the universe. The fabric of me. The fabric of everything. It was the inescapable and eternal. I don't know how the alcohol affected the experience, whether it helped or hindered. It certainly wasn't a bad or dangerous trip, but perhaps I'd have remembered more if I was sober. Before I start my report, I'd like to say one thing. There's nothing that can prepare one for a strong DMT experience. I've taken countless trips and mushroom doses and all other manner of substances as well. I'd read many reports and done all the safety data work but it is by far the most vivid and earth-shattering experience known to man. It compromised everything I've known about reality and left me with endless questions. It is not to be taken lightly. I've tried lower doses of DMT several times before. Most of the experiences were simply terrifying and amazing in their grandeur. Visions of hexagons and rectangles, but nothing that had any real meaning. Just beautiful shapes and colours in a beautiful realm. I'd been talking to other people about how to better understand this chaos that my mind was being thrust into and had come up with a plan. The plan that was recommended to me is intent. Rather than just smoking it and seeing what happens, I'd instead go in there with a purpose. My simple purpose this time was show me. Nothing more or less, just show me. Because of the nature of the DMT experience, I cannot tell you in T plus terms when these things happened only that the total duration was about 25 minutes. On Saturday morning at about 10, I loaded my bong with about 130 milligrams of changa, which contained 50% DMT and other MAOIs, Kapi, Syrian Rue, and herbs designed to lengthen and heighten the experience. I lay back in my darkened bedroom and slowly smoked the infused herb, taking it deeper and deeper in one huge long hit until I cleared the screen. The now familiar carrier wave, the sound I hear when DMT is about to affect me, started winding higher and higher. I only just managed to put the bong down and lay down before my vision exploded inwards. I said, show me, inside my mind. I almost yelled it. Fractal hands reached out of the explosion and pulled me into the void. Everything was twisting with inexplicable shapes and colours. I felt stress. I realised I'd forgotten to breathe and let the smoke out of my lungs. The only part of me that existed right at that moment was my lungs, tongue and teeth. I could taste a strange herb in my mouth, and then I couldn't even feel that. I was in space. In the space with me were insane machines of unknown purpose, flying off to one side, refocusing and then moving to the other side. My perception started being shifted to the left and then replicated on the right side of my field of vision. It was like one of the old TVs with the vertical hold setting out, except my horizontal hold was out and needed adjusting. Suddenly, I was shooting down the static line that was separating the parts of my vision. I was then thrust into another void with twisting shapes. I couldn't think or feel anything. I saw a seed sprout a shoot, and that shoot bloom into a growing fetus being fed by the seed. 
As the fetus grew, it was encapsulated in a skin that became round and formed a planet. I came down to the planet at hyperspace speeds, almost instantaneously. As I stood on the edge of a forest looking down on a small valley, a man rose from the earth with his arms wide out. Energy was flowing upwards through the man as he rose out of the earth. The planet was channeling energy through him and it was spraying out of the top of his head in a cosmic radiance. Then suddenly, I was being pulled in by the energy towards him. Except I didn't go up through him like the rest of the energy but straight into his head. Then my vision whited out and I was back in the void again with the twisting shapes. It seemed I was that man for a fleeting moment, but then I was nothing again. The textures and colours were indescribable, not to mention the angelic beauty of the whole vision. Everything about it was magical and pulsating. I didn't think about death or dying. I didn't even seem to exist anymore. I had never existed before, and it seemed that these were the moments of my creation, and elevation sped up incredibly quick. Then suddenly, all colours faded to grey, and I could feel my body again. I opened my eyes and could see my room. Suddenly I remembered to breathe again. I lay there for five or ten minutes, just trying to get a grip of what I had seen. But my vision was still all trippy and I was feeling quite out of sorts. Oh my. That's all I could think. I got up and looked at the clock in the hallway and about 25 minutes had passed. I've had some time to better understand what I saw and I'm better able to describe it now as this experience was about two months ago. I also had quite a bit of reintegration issues through the weekend and into Monday too. I couldn't stop thinking about what I'd seen and ended up having to draw and write it out to the best of my ability. Even after that it still took me another 12 hours and a long sleep to come right and be able to function properly again rather than walking around in a preoccupied daze. It really was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had. I have a better understanding now of what happened. Certainly a lot more respect for the substance as well. I won't be taking it so quickly or lightly again after having such a strong experience. I'm still on the fence whether I was being shown intrinsic truths about the universe, or if it was all just a self-generated hallucination. I guess it doesn't really matter though, in terms of perception. I went into the woods by the creek shortly before sunset with a music player and a joint of low strength basil changa, an NDMT, harmless alkaloids, basil and cannabis. The changa hit very smoothly, with none of the usual unpleasant DMT taste or harshness. I came up after about 20 minutes of smoking and had beautiful visuals all around me. I particularly remember a knot in a tree that looked like some kind of pink nether pole. I'd like to make a painting of this at some point. I also remember a yellow and green rock with two cracks in it. I remember thinking how cool it would be if it was a meteorite or something. I went walking along the creek and about five minutes in I saw a deer standing in the creek. This delighted me and I thought I was going to have a spiritual nature moment like in Pocahontas. I thought the deer would be more calm if I didn't try to sneak up on her, but once I got within 20 feet she scrambled up the bank and ran away. Oh well, it's still cool. About 10 minutes in I felt the presence of my friend Ahum, a five dimensional alien I met on previous trips. I couldn't quite see him but I would catch glimpses of him in my peripheral vision, touching my shoulder with his hand to guide me through the forest. Ahum led me to an intersection of the creek with other creeks where there was lots of human graffiti in a train bridge. Some of the graffiti looked like an alien language and I could almost hear the sounds of it in my head and read one piece out loud as Shipkrai a consonant cluster I had no idea I could even pronounce. I saw that across the tracks from where Ahem led me was a big patch of tall, healthy cannabis plants. They're not flowering yet, but it was a really cool thing to see anyways. I doubt they have much THC in them, but they did have a mild marijuana odour. So Ahem basically led me to an unlimited supply of CBD flower. Score. I experienced glossolalia during this trip. I sang a song in Daxasnai, a new con language inspired my experience with DMT. I barely understood any of the song, but it sounded cool. I also practiced the words that I'd already learnt, and learned some new words as well. Tleoklat, meaning river. Huawei, meaning what or wow. 
Atten Hoy meant this and that, and Karai meaning grass. Around this time I got to the cannabis patch I was coming down. Come down was very smooth with a nice but mild afterglow. I noticed that the sunset was simply gorgeous, but I felt disappointed that I hadn't brought more changa with me. The last quarter or so of my joint was cannabis, not changa, which I had hoped would enhance and lengthen the trip. It did, but not more than a couple minutes. All things said, this was a magical trip and definitely my best DMT trip so far. I might even go so far as to say it was among my best trips ever. I mixed my changa at a 1 to 3 ratio of DMT and harmful alkaloids to leaf, making for a trip that was very mild by DMT standards, but just right for me. I didn't get any of the panic, throat tightening or head about to explode feeling that I get when I smoke straight DMT. It was a much smoother and longer ride, lasting about 30 minutes. It was more like being on mushrooms for half an hour than free-based DMT to be honest. I regularly use entheogens and smoke cannabis every couple of days. I plan on doing this again tonight, only this time I'll bring more changa. My most vivid and authentic encounter with DMT entities. I had less than half a gram of some changa and was sitting on it for months, waiting for the perfect time to take my changa virginity. The main reason why I waited so long was associated with the pre-flight anxiety of travelling so far inside of my mind, or to somewhere else that couldn't even exist according to the rules of our dimension, and of our experiences that dominated the entirety of our plane existence. It had me in its grips. The perfect time came though, and I knew I had to try Changa on that marvellous summer day. I went to the liquor store and bought a pipe for this special occasion that would only occur once in this lifetime. The pipe was small, blue, and had a mushroom head covered in white dots. It looked like a blue mushroom or a tiny penis with a severe STD. I returned home and weighed out my dose. 137 milligrams of Changa poured out of the bag onto the Gemini scale, and I decided that I would try to inhale all of that. The Changa itself wasn't the 1 to 1 ratio, but only contained 30% DMT. This did concern me, as did my smoking method, as I didn't have a bong at the time, but I just had to inhale the medicinal changa fumes. I poured the 137 milligrams into the blue, STD-stricken penis and laid down in my bed all by myself, while trying to retire the all-encompassing anxiety that DMT bestows upon the curious psychonauts that dare to vape it. I let the lighter lick the top of the green magical herbs and I slowly inhale. The anxiety is gone. I now know that there is nowhere to hide and as being an extremely avid explorer of my own consciousness, I have to take the three hits. One hit, two hits, three hits. The combustion from the smoke that hits my lungs feels so familiar and exquisite. I cannot believe how easy this is as my vision of reality begins to fade and break down into acute fractals that are crunching everything in my eyesight into eventual darkness, until bam, I'm gone. The ether that my soul is acquainted with engulfs my vantage point, as I take in the spectacular manifestation that we all experience once we dissolve from our simple reality. I can feel myself breathing at a swift pace as my mind, soul or both get pushed to their mortal limit. Exquisite trigonometric fractals that resemble DNA strands are the main centrepiece of this white and silver room, that looks quite how heaven is portrayed as being. I get the eerie feeling that I know this place. That I've been here before similar to when I trip on psilocybin mushrooms or vaporise white or yellow DMT, but before I can take it all in, it disappears. What happens next is my most vivid and authentic encounter with DMT entities I've ever had. I see a dark skinned creature with the mouth of the Cheshire Cat from Alice in Wonderland. In fact, after watching the Cheshire Cat scene from the 67 year old film, this beady eyed character had the exact grin and mannerisms. I could sense multiple spider-like eyes floating around the entity's head, as he seemed to be wearing a trench coat. Then he showed me something. In between us blossomed two humans, these two beautiful girls. They were approximately in their twenties, these humanoid beings defined perfection and attractiveness. Silky blonde hair, ocean blue eyes and glowing white skin. The two females bore resemblance to Nordic goddesses. At first the faces were connected and they were one, but not very long after this did they develop in more complexity and started making out. 
I'm in complete shock as I'm witnessing the most detailed and gorgeous scene from any of my countless DMT experiences. This was nothing pornographic, as the large breasts were kept inside the blouses and I never did catch a glimpse of either of the butts. Just love and grace washed over me, as this entertaining encounter continued. The Cheshire Cat entity was still enjoying being the provider of this absolutely stunning spectacle, as I wallowed within a dimension of euphoria and peace. Before anything else could occur, I opened my eyes and had returned to my bedroom. I closed them, trying to travel back, but alas only small fractals blinked as I was forced back into this world full of hardship and suffering. I stayed in one place for ten minutes with my eyes never wider and mouth gaped open in shock and disbelief of what I had just experienced. A rainbow film covered everything in my room and the psychedelic visuals were strong in effect. My hand looked alien as it always does after a journey to the DMT realm. After less than 20 minutes, the visuals vanished, but the emotions did not. I couldn't believe what had just occurred. Did I actually encounter an entity from some other plane of existence who knew I'd be entertained with a display of sexual love from the opposite sex of a member of my species? Or was it just that a separate intelligence deep within my subconscious engaging in a sexual activity since I'm horny as fuck all the time? TLDR Smoked some Changa, and a dark-skinned creature showed me lesbians making out. Changa is the best. All it took was one deep toke. Within seconds, a shiver goes through my body, and I break into another reality. It definitely feels like going through a door or a membrane of sorts. The golden flow of intricate arabesques is starting to fill my whole field of vision. And seconds later, I am bending with time and space, together with multidimensional tapestries. My body now is curved and I sway along these curves as if dancing. Golden, red and green stained glass cobwebs appear. They twist and bend, never straight, always rounded, ever shifting, receding into eternity. Paradoxical, topological labyrinths Escher could only dream about. Why is this place? It feels so familiar like I've just been here. Then when I'm playing a human character in some other dimension. Is this my real home? Why does it feel so familiar? We've got you now. I'm being greeted by multiple invisible entities. I can feel their presence and I can hear them chattering. Are they simply my thoughts, or are they actual beings from another dimension? I guess it doesn't matter at this point, because all of my normal thinking facilities don't operate well in this space. Here I'm just a point of awareness, floating and flying through multidimensional tapestries, castles, cathedrals, and ceilings crafted by celestial masters. But why am I seeing this architecture? Is this what my brain looks like from within? There's this electronic buzzing sound penetrating my reality. Everything is crisp, crackling, electrical and loaded with energy. I want to grab onto normal reality. I open my eyes but nothing makes sense anymore. There's only patterns and elements that constitute reality. But they become one flow of imagery, one great soup of elements. I know that I am in the forest but golden cobwebs invaded everything and there's nothing to grab onto. Time is fractal, and nothing is straight anymore. Vaguely, I am seeing smoke coming out of my mouth still. Holy smokes, has it only been seconds of real time? I can swear it's been at least an hour or even longer. I close my eyes and recline onto a tree. My heart is racing, but it's not uncomfortable, and I don't feel any panic, even though I did used to suffer from panic attacks in the past. Ah, there's the infinite architecture again. An entity sitting on each block of the receding iridescent tapestry. They laugh, they taunt, they make fun. But most of all, they care about me. We got you now, they shout once again. I am not sure whether they mean that I am safe or that I am completely under their mischievous control. It's probably both. But I have no fear, only curiosity. I dig their humour. With my eyes closed, I see only endless labyrinths. An entity sitting on top of golden pyramids trying to touch me, calm me and play. And this smell. The smell of DMT is penetrating my whole being. I'll never forget this smell. 
I can feel myself slowly returning to my home planet. Jesus fucking Christ, I proclaim, holding my face in my palms. Sparkling, magical, ineffable reality is receding fast, leaving me with indescribable feelings of joy and euphoria. Wonderful, wonderful, I bubble like a fool. It was a time machine. I went back to my previous life when I wasn't wearing this human suit. Otherwise, how can I explain the overwhelming deja vu feeling of being back? DMT doesn't work with your imagination, your personal issues and your expectations. It's way, way beyond all of that. It's not concerned about your personal load. In DMT world, you can't grab onto your old self. I mean, you can try, but it's pointless. You bought a ticket to an interdimensional ride, so you better sit down and look and enjoy if you're able to. The sunshine is penetrating me now, giving warmth and energy. The euphoria is unreal. I am back, but still feel like I'm tripping on a lot of acid. But I'm not inside the castle of eternal entities anymore. Life is great and mysterious. This is healing. This gives me hope that no matter how hard our lives are, there is something beyond it. Was it only inside my head? Maybe, who knows. Does it matter though? Who can even tell? All in all, this experience was amazing. It lasted around 10 minutes in total, but it felt much, much longer. The only physical effect I could feel was an increased heart rate and sweating, but I was sitting in the hot sun, so I guess that may explain it. Respect DMT, it is truly incredible. The afterlife is real, an ayahuasca trip report sent in by a subscriber. Ayahuasca is the strongest psychedelic known to man. It is not recommended that anyone tries it without extensive preparation and a trusted trip sitter. I brewed the ayahuasca using 400 grams of ingredients, a one to one ratio, in two halves to increase the effects of the DMT. Firstly, I drank the Banisteriopsis capi half of the brew then waited 20 minutes before drinking the Psychotria Viridis half, a total of 120 milliliters. Half an hour after ingestion, I had managed to evade purging and had mild closed eye visuals. I decided to redose another 120 milliliters. Another half an hour later, I began to purge as the effects of the brew intensified. I saw Mother Ayahuasca's eyes looking back at me, reflected in the glass of my coffee table and she told me that I'll be alright. Soon after, I found myself in a small colourful room, which felt like a portal to the afterworld. There was a large square-shaped basin around half a metre in front of me, with a black sphere levitating in its centre. It had bands of changing patterns, and sometimes was oozing a white liquid into the bucket. There were two entities sitting across from me and interacting with the sphere, sometimes manipulating it with a sort of cosmic spatula. One of the entities looked like the Egyptian god of death, Anubis. I didn't know it yet, but I was witnessing the very birth of Mother Ayahuasca. She then told me that to experience the full effect of the trip, I would need to let go of my life and die. I had already considered this as an outcome of the trip and was ready to go, but I felt so sad that I had to leave my partner behind and literally felt like I will never see tomorrow come. Mother Aya seemed to cry with me, I felt her infinite love and empathy, while the black sphere oozed more of its white bubbly fluids into the basin. At this point, I was sat in a meditative stance, and considered what position I want to be laid and found in when I die. I decided to curl into a ball, and close my eyes for the very last time. I was ready to pass away, but I told my partner what was happening first, as I could not leave without fully saying goodbye. She felt scared and thought that I had taken the ayahuasca to commit suicide. I decided to stay for her, as she was really upset. I was struggling to explain what was happening and that I would come back. At this point, it was exceedingly difficult to hold on and not die, but I eventually came back and had one foot in reality. 
The energy it took to hold on to my life was immense, and it even made me purge. From this point onwards, I could often see woodlice and ants crawling over the surfaces within the portal room. They made patterns and shapes of their collective formation, and there were big spiders which danced across my vision. I began feeling queasy again, and decided to lay on the floor near my purge bucket. Mother Aya brought my attention to a particular anxiety of mine, and told me how to feel comfortable with certain life situations that I have struggled with for years. I purged again, and felt like every purge expelled the negative emotions and energies in my whole life. While laying on my rug, I noticed a familiar smell. It was the smell of my grandparents' house, who had passed away years ago. It was warm and loving. A few moments later, I was able to explore their house as vividly as it was in the past. As I entered the kitchen, I felt their presence, and they gave me an overwhelming feeling of love and compassion as they hugged me. I had the chance to tell them I miss them, and even though they never met my partner, they told me they love her as part of the family. At this point, my partner and I were both crying at the beauty of everything. I had access to all my dead relatives, and met my great-grandparents too. Later in the trip, I decided to try and visit a time and place in the past that only my partner had ever been to. I was given the opportunity to do this in a recent acid trip, but never actually followed through, as we were with a friend at the time, and it concerns a very personal subject. I focused in on a point of view at the time, and struggled to gain any vision. Just as I began to lose concentration, I found myself in an L-shaped room, and could feel the presence of the people within it. I was able to fly around the room and describe certain details to my partner, such as the type of glass from which she was drinking. I was very sceptical about what I could see, as she often drinks cans rather than a spirit in a mixer. I was amazed when she told me that the vision was actually correct. This is now something I intend to practice on all my future journeys, as I aim to explore consciousness and what causes this strange phenomenon in my trips. Another intention for the trip was to try and communicate with my houseplants, as I had heard this was possible in the trip reports of others. A couple of them are not growing as healthily now, and I asked them why. They told me it's because I had lost my love for them. The plants I loved the most showed me how it makes them flourish, and if I love them all unconditionally, they will all flourish. Love really is the essence of life itself. This experience was mind-blowing and it makes me wonder if the psychedelics can be used as a medium. Since the trip, my outlook on life has changed completely. I now believe 100% in the continuity of consciousness after death. Heaven is whatever you desire most in life. For my grandparents, it's for them to be reunited again in their family home. I have a lot to learn from this journey, and my partner has decided to try the brew for herself next time. If there is a god, he loves fractals. A Mescaline, LSD, DMT, and XLR11 trip report, posted by a crazy engineer to earwid.org, September 10th, 2014. Having a fair bit of experience with LSD and DMT, I wanted to try something new for New Year's Eve. My friend and I each took 500 milligrams of Mescaline hydrochloride, which we put into gelatin capsules. Having read that Mescaline causes nausea, I took it with 30 millilitres of Pepto-Bismol. He took 15 millilitres at first. We were accompanied by another friend who took two tabs of LSD, rated at 100 micrograms each. My friend and I are relatively small people, about 120 pounds and 5 foot 5. I am on 10 milligrams of escitalopram. He isn't on any medication at all though. The friend who took the two tabs is on 20 milligrams of citalopram. Effects are noticed within the first 30 minutes. It hits about 10 minutes before my friend who took acid felt anything. As the effects build up, so does the nausea. It is quite bearable, mostly an upset stomach and general discomfort. I note that the mescaline is very different from acid in terms of how it hits. 
it's constant and gradual. And there doesn't seem to be any peaks or high points, like my friend on two tabs is experiencing. He's cranked up and energetic, while my friend and I feel incredibly peaceful. The visuals are fairly strong, as far as the visuals I've experienced on acid were like. Christmas lights outside seem brighter, and everything is breathing and warping. And when I look at my carpet with flower patterns on it, it appears as though the flowers are swaying within the wind. The effects continuously build in intensity. About two hours in, my nausea is gone. My friend still feels ill, and takes another 15 milliliters of Pepto-Bismol. Within 30 minutes, he's totally fine. If I were to do this again, I think going above the recommended 30 milliliters to something like 45 milliliters would have been more effective. Neither of us felt all that uncomfortable though, and neither of us felt the need to vomit. So, I suppose that was a happy success. It is interesting to note that relative to LSD, mescaline does not seem to affect one's cognitive abilities nearly as much. A little focus is all that I require to have a regular conversation and appear relatively normal. I didn't necessarily have the desire to do so, as it is much more enjoyable to be silent and take things in, but purchasing cigarettes was a far simpler matter on mescaline than when peaking on an LSD. At about the three hour mark, my friend on mescaline smokes some marijuana. I smoke a moderate amount of 5-FUR-144, a synthetic cannabinoid that acts like marijuana at low doses, and more like acid at high doses, synesthesia, mild hallucinations, etc. We both begin to see traces. The effect is quite like looking at stereoscopic 3D images that requires red and blue glasses to see. Outlines around everything are obscured by multicoloured traces. This effect subsides after 30 minutes or so, and we're back to the standard effects of the mescaline. A wonderful sense of calm, enhanced colours, warping of patterns and breathing. Our friend on acid eventually leaves, and we're about four hours into the mescaline trip. It's feeling as though it is more or less levelling off, so we decide to turn things up. We each take one tab of LSD, rated at 100 micrograms each. We feel the acid come on quickly. The calmness of the mescaline is being overridden by the speedy edginess of acid. Our visuals start getting much stronger. Colour intensity is three times that of the mescaline alone. Mild LSD-like fractals appear in patterns on the ceiling, but to a fairly minor extent. When the heating system within the house turns on, I hear fast and beautiful guitar solos within my head. My friend, of course, does not hear them. It is merely my mind reinterpreting generic words of the rushing air as something very beautiful. The music sounds like nothing I've ever heard before. It's very fast and intricate. I'd never be able to replicate it on paper or hum it, as it's going so quickly, and I don't have the necessary musical talent to transcribe it. About an hour or so into the acid, or so I believe, we haven't really been paying as much time to the clocks aside from whether or not the new year has arrived. We freebase about 50 milligrams out of the machine, which is effectively just a glorified crack pipe with some steel wool. It did not hit anything like DMT typically does. The changes between the two of us off of tinfoil and then A in visuals were very, very minimal. However, the change in our headspace was drastic. The edginess of the acid was totally removed, to be replaced with the sort of single-mindedness that DMT provides. The calm from the mescaline was back stronger than it was before. The next 40 minutes or so feel like a prolonged DMT trip with the mescaline and LSD hybridised visuals. This is very enjoyable, and seems to redirect the trip from a general craziness into a focused and calm direction of external information. It is hard to put into words. As the effects of the DMT seem to subside, I like to smoke a rather substantial portion of 5FUR144 and my friend smokes the last of his marijuana. He also takes a very small amount of 5-FUR-144 as well. At this point, things start getting crazy. My visuals immediately go into hyperdrive. The traces come back seven or eight times stronger. The edges around my friend are warping along the edges of his face, flowing along his bone and muscle structure. The traces themselves are constantly changing colour, and consist of three to four layers in constant movement that look much like something from Apocalypto or Maori tattoos. His hair is warping and twisting, 
He looks very intense, with the sort of psychedelic war paint superimposed over him. Looking around the room, things seem to be resembling Mayan or Incan art. I'm not a religious person, per se. I used to be a hardline atheist, and prior to this experience, I would describe myself as agnostic, open to the idea of a higher power. But I was absolutely opposed to any organised religious interpretation of what that power actually is. I've always just viewed chemicals as chemicals. Mescaline was just another drug. At this point though, the imagery I'm seeing in my carpet gets warped into is so strikingly similar to ancient runes and designs from that region of the world that I begin to have my doubts. My friend looks like some sort of ancient warrior, and the plant behind him is warping into amazing designs that at the time seemed to be very mathematically designed. We put on some white noise in the background. We both stopped talking for the majority of the next three hours. We both are overwhelmed by sensory input and experience an amazing euphoria. I hear these constant piano solos and other forms of incredibly intricate music within my mind. The synesthesia I'm experiencing is beautiful. I look at something with lots of colour and hear more noise. I look at something simple and the noise is greatly reduced. Everything I look at now has this amazing, beautiful simplicity to it. My friend and I feel that the room we are in is perfect in every single way. As I look to my ceiling, I see incredible intricate fractals being formed out of the material of the ceiling. They are constantly changing and wonderfully complex. They tessellate with one another, and are beyond virtually anything I have ever seen online. I am able to control them with my mind, and can have them form anything I imagine within my mind's eye. Over the course of the three hours, I find myself contemplating things about life, humanity, God, and the universe. I feel as though I am lost within the imagination of my childhood, and before me, my every thought is animated on the ceiling. The most profound portion of this experience was when my friend and I were looking at my bookshelf. We were so overwhelmed by this incredible sense of calm, wisdom, and knowledge. It was strange. Without even opening the books, we felt better. Smarter. A sense of acceptance and peace that I have never felt so close to experiencing in my life. It was incredibly fulfilling and spiritual. I felt amazing. It simply cannot be put into words though. I recall thinking to myself, Ah, this is why we have artists. To put feelings and emotions into forms that cannot be expressed by words. I'm still able to recall that calmness. It is the closest I have ever had to a religious experience. In that moment, I said to my friend, If acid makes me feel beyond a doubt that there is no God, mescaline makes me think that if he does exist, he sure loves math and fractals. After the three hours, things went back to the standard mescaline visuals of warping and mild colour intensity. We smoked some more 5FUR144 a few more times and get similar, though lesser, in intensity experiences. I can honestly say that this was one of the best experiences of my life. I've never expected this from any sort of drug. All in all, the whole thing lasted about 10 hours. I took a codeine tablet before heading to bed, and was able to fall asleep within 1-2 to two hours. My friend did not take one, and he was up for the rest of the night, which is about 7 hours. The Doom Train, a 25i NBOME and Salvia Divinorum trip report, posted by M to Irwood.org, March 8th, 2018. I was well into a pretty heavy 25i NBOME trip when I decided to take a teensy tiny little hit of 25x Salvia that was bestowed upon me through some fortune. Exhaling, I laid back and felt all the oncomings of this. I immediately noticed the intense, sharp, geometric and orderly visuals of the NBOME begin to morph and round off at the edges, becoming more animated, organic and fluid, and went much further in depth. There was a real life and meaning to it now. 
aside from pretty colours and shapes, that is. Along with this, I felt the presence of someone, or more than one maybe, some unseen hand unfolding and revealing various pages of this reality for me. It was like a circus joke, a figuresque thing, in the corners of my perception, manipulating the world in front of me, turning the pages. I started feeling I was in a great festival of life in all the universe. From out of the corners of my perception, I felt the warm company of others dancing and morphing and frolicking around me. There was a very feminine presence to it all, the soul of womanly things, surrounding me, welcoming me to this world. I giggled and felt joyous. I sat in this experience, not feeling too out of place, as otherworldly as it all seemed. Slowly, the salvia wore off, and I was back into my N-bomb world. Now, the N-bomb world didn't seem so intense or deep as I had thought, compared to this little taste of salvia world. I just had my first trip within a trip. Then, I decided to take a normal hit and hold it in for a good time. Now, I don't know what I was expecting, but this is beyond anything I've ever thought possible as a state of being. Being conscious and witnessing what I did will forever have a lasting impact on my life. So here's my interpretation. Putting this to words to the best of my ability, which oddly won't be that difficult compared to trying to describe, say, LSD or mushroom trips. Exhale. Now, I'm expecting something similar to what I just felt earlier, but with a little more zing, so to speak. God, I was wrong. So very wrong. Time freezes, and I realise something very big is about to happen. Very big. Oh no, I thought to myself. Too much? I knew it. This was it. Titanic was about to hit the iceberg. My perception of sound went to a flat silence, and all I heard or sensed was this massive machine approaching from far away. And by massive, I mean Unicron planet devouring massive. Just being aware of it was so weird. It was so big, and it felt like it sucked all the air out of the room, like a vacuum created on a beach before a tsunami. There was a low rumbling, and it rumbled with the force of a great machine that I could feel shaking me. The shaking felt physically real. It approached from the distance, making whirring and whizzing noises here and there. It was just so big. I could feel this machine was sweeping a route, like an ice resurfacer or a lawnmower. It got extremely close, and then whirred off along its path into the great distance, then coming back in a swelling ferocity. To and fro it went. Luckily, I was a little prepped for this from reading some great stories of salvia experiences, and I realised I was about to be shredded up once the machine made its pass over me. But still, reading about it simply cannot prepare you. I waited, somewhat afraid now, only frightened at how truly serious and big this felt. What is it going to do to me? This machine was mowing the lawn around my mind and it would soon mow over my very mind itself. Everything in front of me, in my physical space, began to push towards me, cluster up like an invisible hand was mashing my room into me. I stared at one spot on my wall, by a speaker and a can of beer sitting on top of it, and just waited for it. I felt this machine shredding right past me. I was afraid to look anywhere else and just wait for it to hit me. Then... My turn came. It unzipped the seams of my reality. I saw the cracks open up in the walls and little faces peering back from behind the scenes. The can of beer and speaker became an intersect of where this machine had sliced through, and reality peeled back from floor to ceiling. It was like a knife tearing open a curtain. There were cuts and slashes all over my walls and it was so vivid. It was just like seeing a knife tearing through a curtain but with even more fluidity than with cloth. The beer can had a face now like a cartoon. It was very much alive. All the objects and anything near these torn edges had faces and life to it, like little cartoon characters. I literally saw the very fabric of reality rip open, and the borders around and in it come to life. When I looked into the other side, it was almost like 
Oops, you weren't supposed to see that, you know. No data written here yet. I wasn't sure, but looking into or out of my room, I saw these puppeteers holding my room together. These chameleon-like camouflage ninja people. They posed and stretched out on all sides of the walls and corners, holding it together in disguise, like they were supporting a front or a hoax. When I noticed them, they shapeshifted and acrobated themselves elsewhere, and the room itself disappeared. This was a very brief and bizarre moment. I had no sense of inside or outside at all. Was I looking in at this, or was I looking out? It seemed like I was seeing the universe's safeguard of experiencing technical difficulties. We'll be back with you shortly, while the rest of the program loaded itself up. Looking back at this specific part though, I think I was just experiencing a space beyond my three dimensions and couldn't quite come to terms with what it was, and I was just witnessing the architects of these constructs move about, like I was backstage watching the acts play out. The shredding continued, or so I thought, but it was just gone suddenly. I was expecting it to get stronger and more intense, but it levelled off and faded out peacefully. Going back a sec, it's important to note that during the shredding phenomena, I could feel a very unique but distinct burning sensation on all the edges this machine was cutting, like open wounds. It felt like a fire to me, but not painful, just this fiery feeling in evenly cut folds. Then, I realised that was it. I'm in Salvia world now, all the way in. It really wasn't that bad after all. It was just that serious impending onset of something, something huge about to happen that took me aback. But once I was there, I felt okay. I also felt taxed, like I'd reached the top of a mountain after a strenuous climb. I lay at the peak, exhausted and overwhelmed. I can't really describe much of the rest. I saw the fantastic inner workings of the nature of reality, or the little souls and people that work all the magic like a circus act. These creatures were very clown-like, nimble, cartwheeling and flipping and flowing here and there. I just couldn't keep up. They seemed shadowy and elusive. I got a glimpse of all this, and then the high receded. The entire time I just kept saying, Oh my god, wow, to myself over and over. I have no idea. I didn't know it could be so big. At this point, I was just in too much awe to try to make sense of anything. I was just happy to know that I managed to get through it. I called this strong force a machine, mainly because of the sounds and vibrations I was getting from it. It was like a hedge clipper or buzzsaw. It had some very calculated and mechanised notions to it, but at the same time, it was just simply a huge surging force of energy. It was a very defining threshold between realities. One would have to actually experience it to understand how truly massive it actually feels. It also seemed finite though in a sense. I could sense its largeness which meant it had a size, right? Well, maybe for another time. I know a lot of higher level trips describe being shot out or blasted out into space, whatever decorative words you want to choose. But for me personally, it felt like it all came to me. I didn't actually go anywhere. I was here the whole time, but the rest of it, it blasted into me, or the space that I know was reality. This was one of the most amazing experiences in my life so far. A Sublime Journey, an Amanita muscaria and Hawaiian baby woodrose trip report, posted by Earth Traveller to Irwid.org January 4th, 2019. Amanita muscaria mushrooms have been used for centuries to alter consciousness by shamans in Siberia and other cultures. Occasionally, I found beautiful specimens among the pines in the backyard of my Wyoming mountain home, before they're harvested by squirrels. This spring's weather conditions produced an unprecedented huge crop of large ones, some the size of tea saucers. 
They appeared just as I'd begun reading Michael Pollan's fascinating study of psychedelics history and ongoing research, How to Change Your Mind. The synchronicity was my green light suggesting it was finally time to experiment again, so I gathered and dried a batch of Amanitas. In the early 60s I took a couple of trips with morning glory seeds. The first time I prepared well, had a good guide and had a transcendent experience. My second trip though was awful, because I wasn't careful enough about set and setting, and took the drug out of curiosity rather than as a sacrament. The last of my six LSD trips was in the early 70s. Aside from cannabis, that was the extent of my drug experimentation. For the last several years, I'd been feeling a growing urge to once again try an entheogen, a drug that causes one to become inspired or to experience feelings of inspiration, often in a religious or spiritual manner. I've studied Tai Chi for over 45 years, and have faithfully practiced meditation, mostly Buddhist insight meditation, for over 40 years. I'd been feeling stuck in my meditation practice for a while, and hoped a mushroom journey would help me find a way through that. Although the fluidity of the sense of self is familiar territory to me by now, I believed the mushroom would also make that more clear. And it did. In order to be a better guide for me, the trusted friend who agreed to be my anchor read Pollen's book, and took a mushroom journey by himself a couple weeks before mine. He lives in a gorgeous rural setting, far from neighbours, with a river running through the backyard, a perfect retreat space. Around 9.30am on September 12, 2018, I carefully chewed up a medium-sized mushroom, one medium cap of Amanita, and four Hawaiian baby wild rose seeds, chemically similar to morning glory seeds. I included the seeds because my friend had taken them on his mushroom trip and had a powerful positive experience. The mushroom tasted earthy and unique, and the seeds had little taste, and I started experiencing a perceptual shift within minutes. So much happened during my mushroom journey that the following day, I thought I could write an extremely long story or a short novel about it. Instead, I've had difficulty writing anything at all. The experience was so profound that words can barely hint at the reality. The day was sublime and magnificent, and I spent much of it in awe. Recalling it continues to inspire awe as well. Because of my meditation practice, I encountered nothing unfamiliar. Yet like looking at things through a microscope or a telescope, the ordinary was transformed into the extraordinary. My primary goal was to ask the mushroom's help in exploring some habitual physical knots. In particular, one calf muscle I've been trying to loosen for years with little success. When my friend massaged it, his touch released a stream of childhood memories involving my large, close, extended family. I was transported to a family farm and such through memories and feelings until settling on a painful incident involving a cousin's betrayal. The accompanying humiliation was apparently the source of my leg discomfort. I have yet to understand the connection fully, and there has been no noticeable change in the muscle. Touch on the other knee brought up memories of its own physical injury, which also happened around that time involving another cousin. I was surprised to discover many tight muscles in that calf as well. I've been exploring that injury's physical consequences since the memory came up in Tai Chi years ago, but I paid little attention before to the emotional aspects of the memory. I now recalled humiliation. Growing up in Wyoming with great pressure to cowboy up, tough it out, be a man, and above all, don't be a sissy and cry. While exploring my calf muscles a few days later, I remembered the phrase, to cut someone off at the knees, defined as to squelch or humiliate suddenly and thoroughly. And this made perfect sense. I spent much of the day thinking about my many cousins and countless other people I love. Each person I thought of seemed quite present, in a state where time and space were far more elastic. As I lay on my back on the grass under a favourite tree, listening to the river, watching the blue sky and clouds through shimmering leaves, each falling leaf seemed like a jolly little reminder to wake up. I felt profound love for the tree, which had provided me welcome shade on many summer days and opportunities to watch nesting birds. I realised that everything in nature can be a teacher if we just slow down enough to truly pay attention to the natural world, including the body itself. 
Many insights came while thinking about my Tai Chi students and how I might teach them more effectively. I realised that we contract our neck muscles in reaction to thoughts of both superiority and inferiority. When we feel inferior or unworthy, the mid-back bends forward, the shoulders round in submission and defensiveness, and the neck pinches. When we feel superior, we tighten the mid-back, pull the shoulders back, and tilt the head back in conceit, pinching the neck. In addition to moulding customary posture, this dynamic also happens at subtle levels from moment to moment, as our thoughts constantly swing from one pole to the other, finally coming to rest only when the ego is silent. I came to regard the mushroom as a wise, benevolent guide and helper. It reminded me frequently to notice the tensions in my belly as well. Although I never actually felt nauseated, throughout the day I felt countless gentle upchuck impulse signals to slow down, pay attention, and relax the abdominal muscles. The closest I came to nausea was in response to my friend's suggestion that I take a later booster dose of mushrooms, which I declined. The subtle nausea signals continued to a lesser degree three weeks later, repeatedly showing me how habitually I hold unnecessary belly tensions. Over and over I was reminded to let go of any resistance as soon as I noticed it. I was pleasantly surprised by how functional I was throughout the day, and the experience bolstered my confidence in my ability to deal with whatever may come my way. My friend said later that I was unusually gregarious and extroverted. I became very talkative, and was aware that my unusual behaviour was sometimes unsettling to him. I got plenty of practice watching my impulse to apologise. Years ago at a three week meditation retreat, a new group of people joined us halfway through. Their much faster energy felt like being in a swarm of bees or a herd of buffalo. Similarly, during my mushroom journey my friend's pace seemed like sitting next to a busy freeway. When I went to bed at 11 that night, my mind was still so active that I didn't fall asleep for a couple more hours, well past my usual bedtime. In the course of my mushroom journey, I offered up two prayers. May I be a clear channel for this love, and may this understanding continue. The increased level of sensitivity and body awareness does continue. Whenever I slow down enough, I can easily find my way back to that awareness. When I step outdoors, nature clears my mind more easily than before. After a lifetime of soap opera drama and angst, much of my time in recent years is spent in peaceful bliss. My mushroom experience taught me a different way of seeing, making that state easier to access. I'd like to take another journey in solitude, perhaps next spring to see how that changes the experience. Next time I'll skip the Hawaiian baby woodrow seeds. Wondering whether a dried mushroom qualifies as a living being right now. I recall the Buddha's encouragement to avoid holding on to the idea that a self, a person, a living being or a lifespan exists. But nonetheless, I imagine the mushroom as a friend, living under the soil in the backyard, now asleep for the winter. Cambo, Ayahuasca, and 5MEO DMT Trip Report, posted by Not My Real Name, to the Trip Report subreddit two years ago. Last weekend, my wife and I did Cambo, followed by Ayahuasca, and then followed by Bufo Alvarius, or 5MEO DMT. We had this experience in Playa del Carmen, Mexico, with the same shaman as our last experience. And this was my first time doing Cambo, and it was rough. As far as purging goes, this was some of the most intense bodily purging experiences I've ever had. It's more intense than the purging that I did during any ayahuasca trip so far. The shaman gave me eight dots of Campbell on my right shoulder. I was sweating so much I could literally feel it pouring out of my veins and off my face. I was shaking and it was hard to stay upright on my knees at some points. I had this enormous headache that prevented me from being able to respond to people. My vomit was also yellow and very dense. After about 10 minutes of this, it was done, and my throat hurt because of all the acid. We were then moved on to the ayahuasca, 
and this was my third ayahuasca experience, the second one for my wife. My intention for this entire experience was to let go of a lot of fear and overthinking that I'd been struggling with for the past months. There were seven of us there in total, and I will also talk about what I have witnessed from their experiences, especially my wife's, whose experience was especially interesting, and my own experience wouldn't have been complete without the lessons she had learnt through hers. Before we took ayahuasca, we all had rape, a type of tobacco that clears the sinuses. The rape gets blown into the nose of a pipe by the shaman. I took one full cup of ayahuasca, and we all laid down for about 30 minutes. After 30 minutes had passed, the shaman offered us yopo, another type of tobacco that is administered similarly to rape. It helps the DMT and ayahuasca move more easily to the brain. During my previous ayahuasca experience, I also took it. But after taking it last time, I just saw these geometric shapes and puked and passed out. I didn't really remember anything of it. I chose to take half a cup more of ayahuasca and wait patiently. My wife also chose to wait, but everyone else had yopo. Nearly immediately, everyone else started purging. One woman in the group, let's call her Daisy for her own privacy, started laughing after purging and was talking out loud to ayahuasca constantly. She was having a great time, and even though I'm sure many of us including me found it a little annoying at times, I didn't try to focus on that, and instead chose to focus on being happy for her. I was glad that she was having a good and valuable experience for herself. Pretty soon, Daisy started talking to family members that were dead, something I didn't know Ayahuasca was capable of doing. Daisy went back and forth between talking to dead people, purging, dancing, and helping others with their own experiences. She was seeing auras and also kept saying, OUT, whenever I would throw up later. At this point, my wife was deep in her own experience, but I still didn't feel much of anything. I decided to ask the shaman for a little bit of yopo, just to make sure it wouldn't completely knock me out instantly. Pretty soon after I had the yopo, I started purging into my bucket. My vomit was pitch black and had a consistency of charcoal-like ink. After purging, I had this huge headache. I lay down on my side feeling like shit, and the overthinking then began to commence. I didn't have nearly as deep of a connection with ayahuasca as the people around me. Part of me was afraid that I wouldn't experience anything, but another part of me knew that I had to let go and trust that whatever I was experiencing right now is what I truly needed. It's not like I've never had a good ayahuasca experience before. For example, my first ayahuasca experience was wonderful, and I did that one in the Netherlands. During that experience, ayahuasca told me a lot of things. For example, it told me I would get married to a woman with long dark brown hair and have a son. Ayahuasca asked me to name my first son. I named him Troy. Although my son isn't born yet, I met and married my wife who perfectly fits the description. Although I will admit, it's not hard to find someone to fit that description really. Ayahuasca also told me that my life would be easy from then on. That I'd suffered enough and learnt all the lessons I needed to learn. I was happy to hear this, but part of me didn't really believe it yet. Even though I believe there is immense power in these spiritual guides, it is hard to believe everything they tell you. There was more to my first experience, but I just wanted to include the most relevant stuff above. This ayahuasca experience stayed pretty much the same. I kept having a headache. I just told myself that it was ayahuasca rewiring my brain, and tried to focus on trusting that this is what I needed. I had some self-dialogue that helped me make peace of my overthinking, and I also felt a heightened intuition. Before I tell you what happened when I took 5-MeO DMT, I want to tell you a little about my wife's experience of ayahuasca, mainly a few events that took place and things ayahuasca told her that I found very interesting. First, she went through a bit of struggle before loving and forgiving some bad players in her past. Then, she laid back down and thought her experience was done. Nope. Ayahuasca started telling her all sorts of very interesting stuff. First off, Aya told her that she was one incarnation of the Indian god Kali, I was one incarnation of Shiva, and Daisy was an incarnation of Durga. My wife and I were next to each other in the circle. Normally couples are separated to make sure they don't interfere with each other's experiences, 
but in this case the shaman let us sit next to each other, and we agreed not to interfere beforehand. At first we thought that there wouldn't have been any ayahuasca, but because we asked our shaman if she had it available that day, she made sure to get some. She was originally only planning to have a booth or various ceremony. Ayahuasca told us that we were at the centre there, because we brought together this gathering, and our energy was there to help some of the others who were on their own paths there as well. Ayahuasca also told her that this was her last life as a human on earth, as well as for me. They told us that we had learnt all the lessons we needed to learn, and were coming home together after this life. Just as she started doubting everything Ayahuasca was telling her about being incarnations of Indian gods and this life being our last, a small black snake was touching her feet. She initially thought it was the DMT fucking with her, but just to make sure, she asked the shaman what was going on, and it really was a black snake. For anyone who doesn't know, black snakes are also a part of Kali and Shiva's mythological identity. In Hindu mythology, the snake primarily represents rebirth, death and mortality. The shaman put the snake back on the grass, and it moved on to do whatever snakes do. The morning after ayahuasca, we get as ready as we can after a night of hardly enough sleep and meditate to centre ourselves for the bourgeois various experience. I go first, but didn't really feel my first hit. The smoke was less harsh than I expected it to be, and it was fairly easy to keep it in my lungs until the next hit. This remained true throughout all of this experience. After I took the second hit, I could start to feel my body vibrating slightly. Then, I took the third hit, and the vibration I felt quadrupled fast. I started to close my eyes when the shaman offered me a fourth one. I took the fourth hit, and kept it in my lungs as I closed my eyes and leaned back. I laid my arms beside myself, palms facing up, opening myself up to the experience. The time immediately started to dilute. The total trip lasted 15 minutes in this world, even though it only felt like 2 minutes at most after I got back. The shaman started shaking the maraca, and the sound of this quickly started to grow louder and louder. At the same time, it feels like my mind is collapsing into itself. Unlike what I've heard most people say about shooting off into a tunnel, it felt more like going within. It was like everything was collapsing into my mind and at the same time, expanding into more and more white light. All I was saying to myself the whole time is, let go, let go, let go, let go. Everything became more and more overwhelming. The sound of the maraca kept getting louder and louder, and was coming from every direction, including from within myself. It was like infinite shaking maracas all around and within me, to the point where all the shaking merged into one really loud white noise. I remember being compelled to say, Woohoo! As I kept letting go of the idea that things were too overwhelming, and let go of barrier after barrier. Every time my ego thought things were too overwhelming, or tried to contain or judge the experience, I let go of it. Part of me realised because I am everything, nothing can be too overwhelming because it's all me. I believe that my interest in non-duality and previous learning about this topic had helped me immensely with letting go of judgement and ego in that very moment. Also, even though I wasn't aware of myself, the world, objective reality, etc at this point, I was still aware of my body in the sense that I knew I had two legs and arms I could move. I could also feel myself making symmetrical arm movements. It was like I was swimming on my back in a pool. I could still feel the ground, and I wasn't judging anything. After some time of shedding layers, the idea of something overwhelming had disappeared, and there was a type of bliss present. Unlike other reports I've heard of feeling like God or intense love, ecstasy, etc, this was bliss without judgement, just pure tranquility and peace. More and more white nothingness became just more of this pure white void, yet I was still there and without thought. I knew. I am. This was pure non-duality, just being, without judgement, without thought, without time, without ego. No feeling of being God, no concept of what God is, 
just being. This was the only point where I wasn't aware of my body. I could have been there for an eternity. But an eternity in a realm without time still just feels like a moment in a realm with time. When I came down from that, I could feel my arms and still felt the tranquil, peaceful bliss. I started hearing sounds around me. Slowly but surely, the directions of sounds around me came back and I opened my eyes. I got up and threw up a little bit of saliva on the floor. It felt like a lot more was coming out than just the saliva though, but it felt really good getting it out. At the same time as this, everything was still vibrating intensely. Then, I just smelt the grass. It was such a strong smell, but I hadn't even noticed it until that point. My sense of smell was enhanced and the grass just grabbed my attention immediately. I grabbed the grass and brought my head to the ground to thank this world. It smelled so glorious. Then I just looked and took in the immense experience of the earth. I could see this insanely diverse and alive world right in front of me. The mundane made holy. Or maybe it was more me being made aware that everything mundane was always holy. I could see the ants and other small bugs, the tiny grains of sand, different types of grass, and it was just so beautiful. Infinity right in front of me, right around me, always. I'd never felt more alive than in this moment. I got up and walked over to my wife. As I was walking, everything was still vibrating, and I could feel the energy of people around me. My wife was having a little bit of a harder time, so I helped her through her experience. I did this for about five minutes. After this, I started talking to other people. I have minus 2.75 eyesight, and I didn't immediately realise it, but I could see things without my glasses. Not exactly as clear as with my glasses, but better than I should be able to. I noticed this as I was talking with someone and the face started to fade in front of me when I realised I wasn't wearing my glasses at all. And that was that. I was surprised by how different my Bufal various experience was from what everyone described, but I was also really happy because I felt like I got exactly what I came for. Right now, I'm no longer overthinking anything, and I feel completely connected to this moment. I still feel like my sense of smell and taste is better than before, and there is the understanding of the eternal I amness. I gained a deeper trust in my experiences and what Ayahuasca told me before, as well as feeling less attached to my ego and other things of this material world. But also, at the same time, was appreciating and loving them more as they were. I'm going to do one more booth or various 5MO DMT experience before I leave Mexico, and I'm really looking forward to it. Much love, me. I went to hell and got kicked out. A 5MEO DMT trip report, sent in by a subscriber. I'm a 28 year old psychonaut, with a lot of experience with LSD, salvia and psilocybin. I had my first experience of LSD in high school, and mushrooms not too much later. I've taken very large doses of each throughout my life, so it's safe to say that I have a strong respect for hallucinogens. So in that respect, I don't search out substances, and I rather let them come to me. I remember a friend long ago saying that about DMT, so I never sought it out. But one day at work, I got talking to my friend about it, and told him that I've always wanted to try it, but that I can't search it out. He then went to his car, and came back with a cartridge, looking just like the cartridges for marijuana pens, and said, Here you go buddy, there should be enough in there for a couple of trips. And just like that, I was the proud owner of some 5MEO DMT. I got home and pondered at it knowing that it's much stronger than anything I've ever done in my life. It made me quite nervous, so I put it away for a couple of days. But each day that I had it, I did more and more research, and decided it would probably be best to have a trip to her. I asked my neighbour if he'd join me on this adventure, 
as it was his first time trying it too. So we go over to his place, and I'm doing my best to keep my nerves down. So I ask him if he wants to go first, and he enthusiastically says, Hell yeah. So he sits down in his chair, and I tell him, Alright, everyone says try to take three big hits and hold them in. So he takes the first one, coughs, then takes one more before dropping the pen, and starts giggling like a little boy who just got away with something. This continues for about 10 to 15 minutes. When he came to, all he said was, Man, you've got to try that stuff. But if you remember, I'm still really nervous at this point. I'm trying to calm my nerves by drinking a load of beer, and it works, but was ultimately a terrible decision, as you'll come to find out. I sit down in the chair and start doing some meditation breathing, in through the nose, out through the mouth. I do this for several minutes to try and prepare myself. I take a couple last drinks of my beer, and then take my first hit, as big as I could, but I ended up choking on the unexpected burn and plastic-like flavour, and immediately went back for a second hit. This was just as big as my first hit, and I held it in for a long time. And in that very moment, it started. I remember trying to put the pen down or take another hit, but that's when everything just exploded. I was looking at this standing glass cabinet in the living room, and it exploded into thousands or even millions of different dimensions, in the shape of a giant cathedral, all looking into the same room. I could see myself in each and every one of these dimensions, looking back at myself with the same shock and awe that I was feeling. I could see my friend as well, and I could see his sister, their dog, every detail of the room. It was expanding infinitely with each passing fraction of a second. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was like all of a sudden, I understood all the many possibilities of life. All I could get out of my mouth was... Wow. And this is when things get really crazy. All of a sudden, my chair started heating up so hot that I could feel it burning me. But it wasn't like a painful burn. More like a vibrating heat from far down somewhere below. Here we go, I just remember thinking. And all of a sudden... I was falling, surrounded by a sea of darkness, with bright colours in the pitch black abyss. This was followed by a bright flash of something. It felt like I hit the ground, but I was aware that I was still sitting in the chair back at my neighbour's house. So how could I have hit the ground at all? I was confused and started looking around. I was in a place with a bright orange background, almost like flames, and I could feel that I was not alone here. Within a millisecond of that thought, all of a sudden, two creatures or entities, looking like smashed cartoonish gizmos, one of them reddish orange and the other green and silver, came at me yelling, Hey, you're not supposed to be here. And the other one chiming in saying, Yeah, why are you here? Followed by more of them that I had not previously seen ridiculing me for being an alcoholic, telling me to get out and get clean. Within that split millisecond, I was launched faster than the speed of light back to my chair, throwing up in a trash can that was very well placed beside it. But I'm still not fully back yet. I'm aware that I'm sitting in a chair throwing up, but it was like I was watching it from someone else's body. All I could do was profusely apologise. I wasn't sure if I was apologising to my neighbour, or apologising for intruding to the small smashed gizmo-like creatures. But for about five minutes, all I could say is, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so sorry. I just stayed in that position, which felt like an eternity, until I was finally able to open my eyes, still apologising, realising what happened and immediately started trying to clean my mess, while still being clearly out of it. I assume my trip only lasted seconds, but it felt like forever. When I fully came back too, I'd already cleaned everything up, I couldn't really remember what had happened, but after some time of reflecting on what I could remember, I really think that where I ended up might be what people call hell. But I wasn't actually afraid. It felt serene and powerful. However, the falling through of a chair of fire wasn't so fun. It felt safe for a second, then all of a sudden very uncomfortable and humiliating. 
There are no words to describe what happened, and I hope I was able to share my experience in a way that's helpful in understanding this miraculous drug. My experience didn't make me afraid of it, but it has given me an understanding of something far beyond what I believe we are able to comprehend. In the months after this, I've been much more aware of consciousness and how I feel, and I'm now trying to quit drinking so regularly. I will go back again at some point. I feel like I spent a lifetime there, but also just a blink. What does it feel like to die? A Ketamine Trip Report by Words of Truth Posted to Earwid.org October 27th, 2010 A place to live unharmed by death does not exist. Not in space, not in the sea, nor if you stay in the midst of mountains. Buddha Buddha says that a healthy contemplation of death throughout your lifetime helps to counteract the misguided notion that life is permanent. Yet ironically, we who live in the West are rarely privy to the one phenomenon that will certainly come to us all. Nothing in life is certain, except that one day, life as we know it will be no longer. Death is hidden away, swept under the carpet, kept behind closed doors. And the reasons for this are as numerous as they are varied. Death is private, it is sad, it forces us to confront our mortality to take a long hard look at our life, and to decide whether or not we are satisfied that we have put our time on earth to good use. Did I make a difference? Has my life amounted to anything? Did I learn whatever it is I was put on earth to learn? These are all questions that resonate amongst all of us as members of the human race, regardless of our culture, our nationality, or our religion. But if death is hidden away from us, and if the culture we are brought up in eschews the idea of contemplating death, considers it to be morbid and unnatural, then how are we ever to understand what death is, what death feels like? Well, two years ago, I experienced death, and the experience was so enormous, so profound, that the memory I have of it has been seared into my innermost being and will remain with me until the day I experience it again in earnest. For me, death was the most incredible, breathtaking, terrifying, eye-opening, and deeply, deeply spiritual experience I have ever had. It quite literally brought me to my knees. It unleashed an inhuman scream, a scream that rippled across the universe. It was the scream of a being experiencing his true nature for the first time. My near-death experience occurred two years ago, and although I've only just now plucked up the motivation to write about it, not one day has gone by when I haven't thought of it and revisited the place I was transported to. The realm of the eternal. The divine source. My story is by no means exceptional. There were no apparitions of the Virgin Mary, no tunnel of light, no life review. For me, death was quite simply an unveiling of reality. Samsara. And a complete and utter shattering of my ego or self. I've told the story of what happened to me to many people but this is the first time I've ever tried to put this ineffable experience into some kind of narrative. I spent a lot of time in nightclubs as a gay Australian male, and with that territory, I inevitably came to the temptation of recreational drugs. A temptation I'm not exactly thrilled to admit that I gave into. I was never a big drug user, to be fair, but over the course of approximately 10 years, I did experiment quite heavily with drugs. And to make matters worse, I'm very much an all or nothing type of person. So when I did venture down that path, it wasn't just a little way, it was as far as I could push myself. The week before my 27th birthday, I went out with my boyfriend at the time to the same nightclub I'd been going to for the last 10 years, and like many a night, we decided to drop ecstasy. Nothing exciting. It wasn't very good, and I remember being a little dismayed that I hadn't had the euphoric night I'd been craving. It was then I decided to go in search of some ketamine. Ketamine was not a drug I knew an awful lot about. I'd tried it a few times in small doses and had quite good experiences on it. Had I known then what I know now about what larger quantities of the drug are capable of doing, 
I think I would have run 10 miles in the opposite direction before putting the chemical up my nose. Needless to say, I was handed some very strong care and warned to only take a small amount. Advice I ignored. I snorted a very, very large line of very pure ketamine, with the ensuing result being the story I'm now about to tell, and the catalyst for my creating this entire blog. The ensuing result was that I experienced death. No ifs, no buts, no maybes about it. I'll borrow the following text detailing what a schizophrenic break feels like. A scientific explanation for what occurs when the ego collapses. To produce a schizophrenic break, you need to collapse the ego, preferably as rapidly as possible. There are different ways of defining the ego, but I define them thusly. The ego is a structure of the personality that is made up of what we believe to be true about ourselves, others, the world around us, as well as our place in it. We form these beliefs as based on our relationships, as well as our experiences, the roles we play and the activities we engage in. All of these combined create our ego, which is, for most of us, our sense of who we are. Please note that I have rewritten the following account incorporating some extracts from the Spiritual Emergency blog, which I think puts my experience into words better than I could have myself. The overall experience is described as falling into a kind of abyss of isolation. This comes about because there is no such discrepancy between the subjective inner world that one has been swept into and the mundane, everyday world outside. It's like falling into a death. Not only a death state, but also a death space. The afterlife. The realm of the ancestors, the land of the dead, the spirit world. The common experience here is for the person to look about, and think that half the people around him are dead too. While in this condition, it's very hard for one to tell if one is really alive or not. For me, it was as though I'd somehow managed to tear through the fabric of reality, and to step behind the scenes of the world. Everything moved in slow motion in an endless cycle. I remember being overwhelmed at the very first sight of seeing the universe endlessly revolving in upon itself, as it had done for eons, and as it would continue to do for eternity. The universe is cyclical, a perfect circle. It had no beginning, and it'll have no end. Right away at the beginning, the death experience is accompanied by the feeling that you've gone back to the beginning of time. This involves a regression, a return to the state of infancy in one's personal life history, but hand in hand with this, is the feeling of slipping back into the world of the primordial parents, into a garden of Eden of sorts. For example, it's a very common experience to feel one is the child of Adam and Eve, say, at the beginning of time. This is very symbolic, obviously. It's pretty much a representation of the psyche at the start of one's individual career after birth. I remember distinctly having memories of Adam and Eve and the other narratives I've read about in the Bible. Words and phrases would rise in my mind, as though the entire experience was being narrated to me by some divine voice. Or perhaps it was just my own voice. The voice of the eternal I, that had always been there underneath the self, but had been drowned out by the incessant chatter of the mind. The phrase, that's life, passed through my mind again and again, as though I was realising for the first time what life actually was. I remember seeing language as an entity unto itself, seeing the spirit of language. It is alive, and it sustains this life as we transmit it from generation to generation. I remember seeing all the meaning bundled up in a word like love, and feeling it with the same intensity, as if for that split second the voices of every single human being who had ever uttered it were coursing through my mind. I remember the phrase, the game of life, passing through my stream of consciousness, and laughing as I saw for the first time the mechanics of this game unfolding before my eyes. I remember repeating a word over and over in my head, but it was not an English word, and to this day I don't know how to write it or what language it even is. I do, however, know what the word means. The word being spoken to me from the innermost depths of my soul was my name. Not the name I've been given in this lifetime, but my eternal name. The name I have remembered at the point of all my previous deaths and the name I will continue to remember for as many lives as I am forced to wander through samsaric existence. I saw all the people in my life as though they were characters in my story. Some of them were good, some of them malevolent, but all of them were there for a purpose, to teach me something about myself, 
to allow me to grow as a spirit. It was as though we were all intertwined in a great eternal narrative, and that each of us in our various lives play a role in order for us to grow. Suddenly, it was as though everybody in the room turned to face me, and I felt all of the cells in my body tremble. The thought passed through my consciousness. I'm about to die. I know what's going to happen now. This moment is about to be the moment of my very death. I felt all the people in the room turn in slow motion to look at me, as though something profound was about to happen. Again, there was a primordial word for it that I heard from someone in the room. He's about to go through his, then the primordial word for death was uttered. Suddenly, it was as though all the cells in my body turned to water, and I quite literally felt myself collapse into the ground, back into the very universe from which I first sprung. I let out a cry, an inhuman scream from the very depths of my soul. It is a sound I never realised I could make, a sound that my friends told me later literally stopped every person in the club in their tracks and caused them to look over to where I'd collapsed. As I collapsed into the ground, I was screaming at the top of my lungs a word for my name, as though this unearthly scream of my primordial name could somehow force me to remember who I was and where I had come from. My friends picked me up, and it was as though somehow all the cells in my body reformed, and I began to come out the other side. It was as though for one brief instant, instead of cycling in upon itself, the universe passed one cycle through my body. As I got up, I could see my two close friends comforting me. See, you're going to be okay, it's alright. You're going to be okay because death is not the end. It's just the end of one cycle and the beginning of another. All kinds of imagery comes tumbling across the field of awareness. It's like the mythological image in a perfect stained glass window being smashed and all the bits and pieces being scattered. The effect is very colourful, but it's very hard to discern how the pieces belong to each other. Any attempt to make sense of it is an exercise in abstraction from the actual experience. The important thing here is to find the process running through it all. I'm writing this because I'm sure if you're reading this you've perhaps gone through a profound spiritual transformation yourself, or are looking at taking ketamine to do so. A word of warning, however. Whilst I don't regret what happened to me, I spent the last six months on antidepressants to control the anxiety that developed. I've begun seeing a therapist to help me through this spiritual emergence, and I've now become a practicing Buddhist. I was an atheist before, so as you can imagine, that's a pretty big spiritual jump to make. I'm happy to talk with people who have been through a similar experience. A DMT and methamphetamine trip report, posted to RDMT by the user Niet Zovac. So I'm an almost daily user of intravenous methamphetamine. It has been my drug of choice for the last four years. I'm 31 years old currently. Prior to my meth use, I was mainly a pothead, and would do psychedelics once every couple of months. Now, I've always liked to push the limits of any substance I used. I'd smoke a quarter hours of weed a day. I'd do 10 gram plus mushroom trips, 20 hits of LSD at once, and I've candy flipped and hippie flipped many times, and done ketamine and cocaine. And now with meth, I'll easily shoot a half gram or better at a time. No matter what it was or how much I did, I was always comfortable and under control of myself. I never had any issues with psychosis or delusions, and I was always grounded firmly in reality. So naturally, when I first had the opportunity to try DMT for the first time, I was pumped, and went in head first. My first experience was with a vape cart, and I took five full lung hits, holding them for ten seconds each, and even though I was blasting into hyperspace by the third, I still made the fourth and fifth happen. I had the full breakthrough experience, the instant chrysanthemum of colours and geometry, wading through my vision followed by a hum rising from silence to a deafening roar, my consciousness coming out of myself as an entity danced in fourth-dimensional motions. It beckoned me forth, 
surrounded and pervaded by what I can best describe as prismic light bent into tubes folding in on themselves like a tesseract. I look down and see the way that my soul was interfacing with my body, almost as if I was looking at the inside of a mask I'd pulled from my face. I remained here until I returned to my body, still tripping harder than any acid trip, yet feeling sober due to the large drop off from where I was. I immediately lost my fear of death, and achieved an inner peace I had long been searching for. It was in that moment that I fell in love with DMT, and began to use it very often. Now I had continued to achieve breakthroughs of my use, but it wasn't every time, and actually became less frequent the more I used. And on the occasions I would have a good breakthrough, it always seemed like it was less intense or less long lasting than the first couple times. So I started chasing it more. Looking back, I do think now that I was being denied entry on many occasions, whether it be for my other drug use interfering, or because I needed to reflect on what I was supposed to have learned and wasn't doing so. One morning after being up all night shooting meth, I decided to try and shoot DMT. Little did I know, because of lack of research, that DMT freebase isn't water soluble, so my attempt didn't work, and it just left me with DMT stuck in a syringe. I go to sleep after this, and when I wake, I prep a shot of meth. It's in the rig with the DMT in it, and I don't really remember or think about the DMT itself. As it turns out, meth in solution with water can dissolve DMT and bring it into solution as well. And when I hit my shot, which this one, if I had to guess, was about two tenths of a gram of meth and maybe 50 milligrams of DMT, I was taken by surprise when after the characteristic cough that comes along with shooting meth, I immediately felt the pull into hyperspace. And it was strong. Almost instantly, I bypassed the first initial stages and was completely out on the astral plane. By this point, it was one of the best breakthroughs I've ever had. Crystal clear, very distinct, very strong visions and sensations. And when I came back, I was eager to step it up. And me being me, decided I was going to do it again for science, but with the knob turned to 10. So just maybe an hour or two later, I prep another shot. This time I've got a quarter gram of DMT in the barrel, and just the barest amount of meth that I can use to make it dissolve, which is about 50 milligrams. I decided I didn't want any distractions with this one, so I go and I sit in the bathroom, alone, door closed and noise cancelling earbuds in. I was going to be giving this my full attention. So I get the needle in my vein, and I begin to push. In solution, the shot was right at 50 units. I push it all the way to about 10 units left to go, and my vision gets hit so hard that I immediately ripped the needle out of my arm and threw it to the ground. Before I even saw it hit the floor, I was racing at light speed through hyperspace. I can only remember a few distinct details. The first is that it was so intense and overwhelming that I lost all touch with reality. Not only did I lose my sense of self, but I lost every concept of existence, and each and every one of my senses was gone. I had what I could only describe as a breakthrough out of a breakthrough. Where we normally go when we break through, I was there for a fleeting moment, before pushing past it into a black void. I could only describe this as hell. Although, I was in this black emptiness, there was this sinister energy there laughing at me watching my torment, amused by my utter confusion and fear, and I was here for an extremely long time. What brought me back to reality first was my sense of touch. I reached out and felt my chest with one hand and my head with the other, and as soon as I felt them, I gripped a death hold on both, afraid to let go, as if I might lose myself again had I done so. I then opened my eyes and was still underneath a sea of acid-like visuals, still with no concept of self or any concept of what was around me. I felt small and stupid, as if I was a human, now forced into the body and mind of an ant. It took me five to ten more minutes of sitting there staring at my feet, drooling on myself, for basic understanding of anything beginning to return. And then, slowly things came back. But as they came back, 
All I could think or feel was how utterly strange and stupid existence as a human being is. The fact that we all have to eat and drink and sleep and piss and shit and fuck and come and breathe is so alien and gross to me as I remember each one existing. And then I realised how self-centred and egotistical we all are, with how weird and gross and small we truly are. This was all very difficult to swallow, until it quickly began to normalise as I returned to baseline once again. I was left with an extreme appreciation that I made it back. I made it back alive, and not only alive, but that I am myself, and then I still have time to be myself for now. I've been sober ever since that moment. I've gone cold turkey off everything. And not because of fear, but because there is no longer any drive within me to use anything. Just being alive and being myself, my sober self, is what I truly desire in my heart now. Now I feel like in the future, I may use drugs again, and I may even do DMT again, but I will never do it to that extreme that I did that day. However, for now, I am content and I am at peace. I will say, I don't recommend anybody do what I did, but if you do for some reason, just know that going into it will be a completely life-altering experience, one that someone even as mentally strong and experienced as myself almost didn't come back from. So do this at your own risk.